This week's episode of This Is Only A Test is made possible with support from Evident. Evident is revolutionizing the way personal data is shared. Their simple, secure platform lets businesses confidently know who they're dealing with without handling sensitive personal data. With connections to thousands of authoritative sources through a single API, Evident is the only platform that enables comprehensive, accurate, and up-to-date identity and credential verifications. Check out Evident id.com slash test to sign up and get started to get today again that's evident id.com slash test hey let's start the show for thursday august 29th 2019 welcome to this is only a test the official podcast of tested.com And welcome to a very special episode of This Is Only a Test. Not because we are episode 515 right now, but because this is the episode where one third of us have seen beyond the galaxy's edge. Have, have, we've been through the nexus. Welcome back, Norm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm back. You guys did a great job last week. So, Jeremy Williams, Kishore Hari. Did we? The rightful order has been <laughs> reestablished. The first order? I'm. Uh, it's hard being in that in that front chair. I'm How s- did you decide? I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you're back because we were. Hey, we were. Ac- I'm right here. <laughs> we were. We were accused, and I'm not blaming you. You did a wonderful job in the hosting seat, but I was guilty, as maybe were all of us at one point, of not knowing what we were talking about last week. What, oh, oh no no! Oh, I mean, hundred percent. That's, that's, that's a hallmark of the show. <laughs> yeah, that's on brand. <laughs> I mean, takes. we did that. Partially on purpose because we, were, as we were talking about Matrix Four, none of us could remember what happened at the end oh, of Matrix no, you Three. Guys, okay, uh, confession Wait, I mean, time. Come confession. on, that's a super forgettable movie. Now, uh, I did- Matrix Revolutions. Hello, uh, Tr- Trinity and Neo uh, have to go to the source, and Trinity sacrifices herself. She's the only human who gets to see the light. It's so beautiful. All the, the and then she dies because all the uh, the rebar goes through her. Then Neo makes his way through and then he meets the source like a giant baby and all the wires go in and and then he resists and then he uh, the source then has sends him against the virus of Agent Smith and then you get Burly Man Brawl Part 2 which is him versus the entirety of the Matrix converted to Smith and it becomes uh, basically a Superman slash Dragon Ball Z fight. When is the last time you saw that? Uh, probably 15 years ago. It, it was left indelible mark on my 20s, I, early 20s. I'm going to say, knowing that would not have made our podcast better <laughs> last week. <laughs> well, I did propose that Trinity died at the end of the show, and, of, or at the end of the movie. So, which was, which is, that's the point of contention with this announcement right, right? we're not i mean we're, we're rehabbing you want to so d- discuss it properly now <laughs> what you can do <laughs> is you guys can cut out this part of the podcast and insert it yep. last week as sort of an interstitial conversation to, to set the facts straight but yes because they have announced that carrie ann moss is coming back and so is keanu reeves and lana wachowski is writing and directing it how will this it will this be a soft reboot like they're doing with uh with terminator where it only connects to the first two films it will be you know or Will it take all three of the Matrix and also the Matrix Online stories in which you see what happens after the Matrix is rebooted and Morpheus had died in, in the Matrix Online? What what part of canon will make it in? Trace suggested something last week that I thought was awesome. What if we got Trinity's origin story of how she first enters the Matrix? And Neo is not so Neo. He's like, he's whatever, Mr. Anderson working in a cubicle. I like the idea of that. But then you can't, I mean, then it's a whole movie de-aging, and I don't, I'm not a, fan of, not a fan of that. I do like that idea that it, The Matrix has always been about the cyclical nature of the system of control and the, the variances. And so to for them to find a new Neo and find a new Trinity um, who embody their basically their souls, I, I like that idea. The cyclical nature of control? I watched a different movie, I think. Did you not see the speech of the architect? <laughs> you know what I'd, go. You know what I'd much rather hear about? 
Galaxy's Edge. All right. Okay. So a little bit of uh, what happened this past week. Well, last week, I was gone. You guys know if you listen to the podcast. I was on a secret mission with the team. We'll hear about that in many months to come. But I flew back to San Francisco Thursday night. And then Friday, mm-hmm. which was my birthday. Mm-hmm. Happy birthday, Norm. Thank you. I took the day off and flew down for the first time with a baby. To oh, my first flight. First flight. Test flight. Te- it was. We planned this trip. Literally, yes, it was an anniversary for our wedding, and yes, it was a birthday weekend, but we really did it to put the baby on an airplane because we're also going to be flying for Thanksgiving in two months. So we needed to get the baby on the airplane now that he's nine and a half months old, and we decided to do a short flight down to Anaheim, Cal- Anaheim California mm-hmm. because uh, Disneyland, of course, is there, and also D23 was going on, the big Disney conference. Now, we'll talk about DE23 and all the news came out of that in our pop culture segment, but, well, first of all, how were your weekends? Oh, my God. (laughs) Fine. (laughs) What about you, Kishore Hari? I'm in a panic because I'm leaving for Dragon Con tomorrow. We'll get to that later. Oh, yeah. Costumes? Costume planning? Yeah. Mary Costume McKees. panicking. Do you have to call the McDonald's ahead of time in Atlanta and let them know that you, that the mayor is set to arrive <laughs> and <laughs> prepare the troops for the mayor is coming? We have an arrangement. Yeah. <laughs> the cheeseburgers must be prepared. Jeremy, how about you? Uh, nothing. Tell nothing? me about Galaxy's Edge, man. Oh, my God. Okay. So I'm going to lay down. Uh, this is going to be like a, like a, in a cool new style. Here's the life story before you get the impact. Uh, so... Um, I was only in Anaheim for essentially one day. Flew down, we got there late Friday. We spent all Saturday in Anaheim uh-huh. and then flew back on 10 a.m. flight Sunday morning to make it back for a kid's birthday party. So one day, it's like the, the whirlwind way to do Disneyland. Plus, I did go to D23. That's I crazy. I stopped there for uh, two hours to check stuff out early in the morning while baby was taking a nap. Uh, it's not the right way to do Disneyland or the right way to do Galaxy's Edge. So this I mean, was not... Caveat di- that. Yeah, to be clear, this was not a Disneyland trip. This really. was not... You know, if, if, Beelined to, it to... To do... Yeah, exactly. To do Disneyland properly with a kid or without kids, and that's a whole other conversation of like having a kid at Disneyland is very different than yeah. and having a kid or a toddler. We had a toddler. Like, we used to go to Disneyland for fun for ourselves and could... Really, you know, take our time, stay late, see the fireworks, uh, go on rides multiple times. And Savor we, that Dole I, Whip. I know, and, 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 and eat that Dole Whip, and now we're on keto, and now we see these, and we used to see these families that are like, had their strolls, and why would they go with their one-year-olds or two-year-olds, you know, and it totally makes, I completely empathize with them now. You go for yourself. Not for them. Well, we yeah. didn't. We didn't go for. The, we at, didn't go for the child at that age. Right at that age, we went for ourselves, and the child tolerated being there yeah. in the eighty-five degree Anaheim heat. Now Disney does make it very accommodating for new families because there's a whole uh, family center where there are changing stations and and high chairs and couches. Can you rent a stroller naps. that's in the shape of an X-wing or something fun like no, that? No, no, they do have like hundreds of strollers that people can rent. Right? No, no. The reason you can't do that. Is because of the the square footage of the, the the footprint of strollers. They need strollers to be very compact. Uh, even m- as more a wing then uh, that would be great. Yeah. Or or uh, yeah, a wing for yeah, the snow a wing. Or even like, like a chicken walker could mm-hmm. work. Speeder right? bike, ATSD speeder bike could also yeah, work. Land yep, speeder. Yep. As you're rolling up to Disneyland in your stroller, as we did, there are actually these dotted outlines on the pavement yeah. that tell you you can roll your stroller over this size and over this outline. And if it's bigger than this size, we won't let you in. So you can like test size your stroller nice. as, you're, as you're getting there. So anyway, we did spend almost our entire time at Galaxy's Edge. Didn't even step into Tomorrowland. Didn't even go do Star Tours. Didn't do Fantasyland. Okay. Didn't do, yeah. oh, didn't do a Haunted Mansion. We did right. Pirates because the Pirates is one of the very kid-friendly, baby-friendly rides. So Baby did get his first ride in Pirates of the Caribbean. That was kind of a scary ride for Baby. He loved it. Nice. The water right. splashing. Well done. Well the, done. The sound effects were pointing. It's all very dark. We had Cheerios to feed him to keep him like calm, and he, I think he really loved it. Fantastic ride. But tell me about the approach <laughs> to Galaxy's Edge. So geographically, uh, if you don't know uh, Disneyland. Um, well, this, this 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 is a separate diagram. We'll get to this diagram in, in but a moment. So there was I did not know there was so much space 
to build a new land, right, in Disneyland. Yeah. Because unlike in Walt Disney World, which it's a many hundreds of acres of a uh, resort, uh-huh. of which there's plenty of like forest place they can t- tear down, build hotels, build exhibits, build whatever. Uh, Disneyland is, is confined. It's it, surrounded by a built-up Anaheim, California. Exactly. Hotel infrastructure all around. The fact that they basically demolish, I think, parking lots to make uh, California Adventure at one point right. right, that was impressive enough. You have two big parks right next to each other. But basically, new areas, like they've announced a new Avengers campus at D23, they have to tear down old parts of the parks yeah. to make room for the new parks. A bug's life is gone. Exactly. Disneyland, Galaxy's Edge was this new, they had that area set out and they might've been holding it. And yeah, they, they kind of shifted, they had to move, like the Lake Rivers of America, mm-hmm. they had to drain that entire river and basically m- shift it and build new pavement and resize the wow. entire river in order to make room for Galaxy's Edge. But the room is there. And in fact, Galaxy's Edge is the biggest land inside of Disneyland. Is that true? By square footage. Wow. And there are three entrances, which are cleverly designed, uh, basically uh, tunnel archways, mm-hmm. where once you're inside Galaxy's Edge, I'm it's you know how like the the one of the most amazing parts of the most magical I'll use that word uh, parts of Disneyland is when you're inside. It's designed so you, the outside world disappears. Mm-hmm. The way they theme it, the way they uh, build the the shrubbery and the walls. Yeah, if you like look, some of the walls are there, but they build facades, old timey building facades on Main Street, and where even though you know intellectually there are hotels on the other side, you know there there's a freeway, you know less than a mile away, you are not aware of that. California Adventure doesn't do it as well because of the way that that park is built out. But Disneyland is, once you're there, and mm-hmm. as a kid, like I would wake up from naps and wake up in Disneyland, right? And be like, that's it. you're lost in this, this place. Galaxy's Edge does it so well that when you're in Galaxy's Edge, you forget you're in Disneyland. So it's like a microcosm. It is. It's a, it's a universe within a universe. Hmm. And so went there, and first of all, not very crowded. I mean, yeah, a what, lot of people there. Wait, what day? Even with D23 Saturday. happening? Lines were, uh, the, the big ride there is Smuggler's Run, and that's the Millennium Falcon ride. Yeah. And we're going to go back, let's go back to a picture here. So, uh, but they've over-designed the, uh, the, that aired land where corridors are very wide. I think they anticipated m- maybe twice as many people mm-hmm. to be there. Smuggler's Run, the longest we ever saw the line was... 55 minutes long. Oh, that's nothing. I know. If you've been to California Adventure, when Cars Land open, yeah, right, and that that, that big, yeah, it was two over two hours long. Here, 45 minutes, we saw it as low as 45 minutes for Smuggler's Run. And of course, they talked about in the latest earnings report that maybe people were afraid to go in the summer because they anticipated a lot of crowds and they rise of the resistance. Is the new uh, second ride isn't open yet. So this winter, I anticipate. Lots more people. Like I, I think they'd over-designed the, uh, the the area so much that originally the plan was they would be assigned time slots to even enter Galaxy's Edge. They Remember, did that, right? The whole idea was that you would be assigned like a color code yeah. or like some wristband, and, and then kicked out after and, 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 a, a and, and few and hours. Gently urged after a few hours by stormtroopers. It's by you know, by by crew, yeah. you know, with the wristband it, to you're you're out of here, right? None of that. It was free flowing. All right. In, out, in, out, whatever you want. Is there fast pass for the uh, There is Falcon. fast pass for the Falcon. There is. So you could do that as well. And so they have a fast pass line. They have a single riders line. Oh. All your standard cool. Disneyland style e-ticket rides. Now, geographically, the way, because there's a whole fiction, of course. The, the planet is Batu. It's on the outer rims in the galaxy's edge. So the, the, the impact of the rebellion, the resistance, the first order, hasn't really been felt in Batu, really, and so the the, the idea of the the lore, the fiction of this world of this land is uh, everyone you encounter and all the uh, all the storefronts. It's all rumors and speculation about the First Order, and that way you can engage with storekeepers, engage with cast members, uh-huh. and no one says Star Wars, but they all talk about you know the Resistance. They oh. talk about things they've heard about Kylo Ren. Things they've heard. So there's no like, oh, remember in episode six and in Death Star 2? There's none of that. There's all like <laughs> rumors and speculation. And all that extends even to the, the merchandise as well. That whole area is split between two, I think, main areas. One is more resistance themed. And this is kind of the safe haven. So when you saw, I have a picture I took. You can find it on my Twitter feed. But there's a, an X-Wing 
uh, X wing uh, that's that, that's um, on a landing pad. Right, uh -huh. that's where this area is, and there's a lot more uh, resistance merchandise there. You so can buy in these areas, are there yeah. stores? Are you buying things? Are you eating there? Are there rides? So all of the above. The one that thing, and I'll, I'll say I'll start off with what there isn't because I was both my. To simplify my takeaway, I was both incredibly impressed by engineering and imagineering and theming, but also slightly disappointed because of how I had built up this experience in my head. We had heard stories about how imagineering was going to design robots that yeah. would go around and, and recognize people and interact with that, and and it would be more immersive in almost a theatrical sense mm -hmm. with cast members uh, telling stories and, and characters you interact with. There's supposed to be a persistence element too, where you develop your own character, and then as you engage with the Galaxy's Edge, you know, universe, you become good or evil. And maybe that's that was the ambition, but at least in this initial summer of launch, that's not really there. Okay. There's of course there's a Disney app that you can download, and there's a, like hidden alien text you can decipher, an AR element. There are little things you can interact with if huh. you want to spend that time, but you. You really felt like it was a it was a theme park, right? It was it's it's still another Disneyland land. Now, oh, you're going through all the images too quickly. No, no, I was going to come here, like for theming. So yeah, so for theming, you had these big, basically sculptures, right? You had the X-wing that was on this landing pad. You couldn't get go up to it. That was a little elevated. There was a little fenced off area, so you could take pictures of it. But it would have lights, and as uh, the sun came down, you would have exhaust. And I heard <laughs> rumors that if you achieve a certain part of the app, like if you use the app and interacted enough with the world, the app would let you trigger things on the X-Wing. Oh, wow. Wow. Like, I didn't actually see that happen. Right. But okay. That, that's, I, I, I get if you want to play that, play that lore game and you want to go deep, you could. Uh, they had a giant, uh, not a TIE fighter exactly, I don't have a picture of it, but it's a, it was like a, maybe Kylo Ren's new TIE interceptor. They had that on a, on a landing pad. So that was more in the first order dominated part of the world in which they were, uh, that was the big, like, uh, big statue. And of course, in the middle, right of the heart between those is kind of a free-form, uh, free-flowing marketplace uh, with a cantina. So there's a whole restaurant bar they make reservations for, they do serve alcohol, and then the Millennium Falcon, also a giant static statue. Did you go in the cantina? I did not make, get reservations for the cantina. So you can't even go in? You can't even go, there's a huge line, it's almost like a club. Oh. Right, like I, I, I'm sure there are amazing animatronics and drinks in there. Are, but there, are there musicians in there? I, I don't know. Ah. I, I didn't see. Right, I, I didn't see it. All. I saw, all I saw was this huge line. What's that line for? Oh, that's a cantina. We didn't get tickets for. But there's a whole restaurant, and the restaurant is underneath a, a docking uh, shuttle, and so you have this cool shuttle that's high above. Like the terrain is, the topography is like it's mountainous. Right, there's like spires and then create and, and uh, petrified rock that look like trees that look like rock, mm -hmm. and. The, the general food, there are two big food court areas. One was this indoor one where you, food was delicious, um, but it, it was inside what looked like a landing bay. So you see the shuttle with like things, it wasn't moving, but you see like uh, crates and stuff like that. And underneath, you go inside and you wait in line, you get your food and you sit on like, a bench and, and you eat your delicious food. The other food area, which I'll call out first, and I don't know if I have a photo of this. I don't think I do. Let's go to this photo down here. I'll tell you about next. The, uh, the other food area was, was more of like an outdoor uh, cafeteria where not really a lot of tables, but it was more like a barbecue spit. And this isn't a picture of it, unfortunately. It's a beautiful picture, though. I'll, I'll tell you what this is. This is one of my favorite places. But the barbecue area where you get some like kebabs or um, uh, hot dogs or whatever, it was in the center of it was this giant statue of a pod racer engine vertically mm -hmm. and animated so it would go red and you see smoke and stuff and a robot basically turning the spit that was underneath and they were using this 30 foot tall pod racer engine as the fire to heat up the food the fake <laughs> food and a great place to take pictures and they had built up a gantry around it and yeah. this walkway and so that was Lovely, very immersive, and you can then peek inside the butcher room, and you see hanging animals, like alien animals, of course. Um, so that was all it, wonderfully. It was, it was all real too; It wasn't just projected. No, that was all uh, all physically built stuff. This is all one hundred percent physically built stuff. Uh, then we got to talk about the stores. There were three main stores, two of which I would even call they call them attractions. 
One of the stores is the one, this, I have this picture here. It's huge. There's a, a lot of lanterns above here. This is the high-end collectible relics store. And it's run by an animatronic. This, uh, this character, I got to make sure I get the name right because I was not as familiar with this character. Uh, this character is called Doc Ondar. Doc Ondar. He's kind of a, like a snailish creature, mm -hmm. fully animatronic behind his, like, his uh, pawn store, or pawn shop fencing, right? Just he, he has his minions, his real human minions do the actual transactions, but he's on floor level and he's like spinning around, breathing, interacting, picking things off the shelf. Really? And he's like, he's fully animatronic there. Wow. Yeah, and, and just as a display. And here in this shop, the high end collectible shop, you can buy costumes, you can buy uh, kyber crystals, I, you can I, buy, uh, uh, what are they called, the, um, the Jedi and the Sith, uh, um, uh, the holocrons. Mm -hmm. I watched some stuff online where in somewhere in Galaxy Z, you can buy the most obscure stuff yeah. from films. Like, uh, uh, what's that guy from the, uh, Phantom Menace, Otto, wh whoever the guy was? Quato. Quato, Quato who runs yeah. the junkyard. Yes, this he, he was a high-end version of that. He has those chance dice. Yeah, that you roll like you can buy those. You can mm -hmm. buy the little amulet that like little Anakin gives. Yeah, to you could Amidala. buy a headdress. You could buy all sorts of like br like faux bronze statues. Uh, you could buy the Jerk chess pieces. Very expensive, hundred thirty dollars for four pieces, and that wasn't the full set. You had to buy two of those. Two hundred and sixty dollars <laughs> yeah. for eight degeric pieces. I didn't buy those. Like, they, they didn't look that two hundred sixty dollars worth. But if you go back to the this area, even if you didn't buy anything, you could just look around at the theming. Like the whole second floor here is the artifacts that uh, that uh, the, the he's collected, right? Uh -huh. And so you have like a Gungan. Can, can you in, go up there? You can't. You can take pictures of it. You have a Gungan in in um, in, in bronze or in uh, carbonite. You have like Mandalorian. Uh, armor. You have like stormtrooper helmets. This is all like a part of the lore. Things that have made it to the galaxy's edge, made it to Batu from the wars that people have heard about in that galaxy, from the events of of Star Wars. So you can just like kind of hang out here and and air conditioned, of course, in there. All the shopping areas were air conditioned, and it was a lovely place. And even on the ground level, they had animatronics inside, behind uh, small animatronics behind glass. Uh, like tubes, you know, like, like uh, Sarlacc, baby Sarlacc monster, and things inside water. Like it was very all, all very interactive. The two other awesome stores that they call in attractions were the things were the lightsaber build out area mm -hmm. and the droid build out area. Yeah. I, I didn't go to the lightsaber one because okay. I didn't want to spend that two hundred dollars to buy a lightsaber, which you're really paying for the experience yeah. of assembling lightsaber. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, if I'm gonna spend that money, I'm gonna wait till Avery's like five years old and, and get the most out of bang for the buck by building it with him. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the value in that. Same with the droid area. Droid build shop was incredible. So it is ostensibly a shop. You go in and a line along the walls are clothing or droid parts or you know, uh, things that you can buy. If you look up, you see basically this conveyor belt of hanging droid limbs and droid parts, R2 parts, BB-8 parts, random other droid parts, just on this unending conveyor belt that goes in a circle, right? As if you're in some type of car shop, right? Or a big factory. Now, if you go behind the door, you wanna partake in the droid building experience, I think it was $100, then, they had another conveyor belt with the plastic droid parts that would be, it was almost like a, a, a sushi buffet restaurant. I like was a thinking sushi like, boat. like a luggage retrieval. Exactly. But except imagine as opposed to one luggage at a time, it's like dozens of yeah. droid parts at a time. So really conveying the idea that you're in like, like a junkyard and these droid parts are coming Do through. You grab off of and there you to grab, build? And you grab, you grab your bin and you then pick out whatever pieces you want you, Whatever you, color. You need the components, right? Like you, you need the you torso need, and the head. Exactly. And, the... and you could build a uh, R2 style droid mm -hmm. or a BB style droid. And you, you pull those and you put them in the bin and then you take it to the build station and you got to make sure it's, it's almost like a game. Like you make sure you have the right 
internal components and the right external components. If you're not, then you got to go back. The technique tells you you have to go back and so I'm going to show, I, I don't have the, the picture here, but line along the walls, you have like you know, your BBH roids and above there you have your, uh, your, your parts that are moving in a conveyor belt. Yep. But like it is basically like your luggage mm -hmm. um, conveyor belt of, of all these parts and you take them and then once you assemble it, yep. once you've done, and that's the full experience, you've built your droid you put it on this little pedestal and then it boots up and it comes alive. Mm -hmm. And then you take that droid home with the remote control and you get to pilot it. I understand that so you didn't do this. I didn't get I watched people do it. I understand that the remote control actually has buttons on it that don't do anything unless you do the upsells. Uh, and there are plenty of upsells. <laughs> you can go to the wall afterward and you can buy the accessory. You can buy the R2, like the tray, uh, the drink tray that he has in Return of the Jedi. Yeah. You can buy all these other things that plug in that then activate, like you said, great. the control. Of so course there's upsells. They, they call that an attraction. It is a fully interactive. They call it an attraction? They do call it It costs the same as admission to the park. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. To get right. a droid is that much? Yeah, I understand the lightsaber. It's a hundred bucks. Hundred bucks. It, the if you do the upsells, you're oh easily over one hundred and fifty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So two hundred dollars for a lightsaber, hundred dollars for the droid. But I do think there's personality chips, so you can like buy any. There's probably five or six different personalities you can buy for your droid. Each one's like twelve ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that seeing how happy those kids were and their parents who were doing the droid experience and once the droid came alive, that was a real magical moment. I really want to do it when my kid's old enough. Right. I, I didn't feel like it was going to be worth it for me to do it and then have to do it again. What if, what if... It's not going to close. Your kid does not dig Star Wars. Well, then I'll do it. And I'll All find right. another kid to do it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you kid. Yeah, exactly. You, you want to build a droid? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Uh, those are the three main stores. There was also a, what, uh, it was a more marketplace open store, and this was more like a bazaar, where you, like a bazaar, where you walk down and you see stores, open stores on left and right side. And this is where you could get some really cool. Like we got a tauntaun. I think I forgot to bring it in. I got I bought a tauntaun, a plush tauntaun that has sound effects. Does it op open up? In the, the batteries are. It, started making sounds when the baby was asleep and I had to like <laughs> fumble in the bathroom to tear it open and <laughs> take the batteries out from the inside and definitely, you know, it smells bad on the inside, whatever. Uh, That's great. There's some wonderful, you can buy, get a Wampa plush. Uh, there are, you remember in Rogue One, there was a kid with a Stormtrooper wooden doll in Rogue One? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they sell that as well. So they have like a, a wooden figurine. So this, again, That's cool. back to the lore of like, this is, this is the the outskirts of the galaxy where you you know they're they're hearing about these these yeah. battles and these okay. heroes and these the the, the uh, right the empire and so they've built their handmade versions of their toys you know to sell to the, the local folk or the tourists it's like whatever. the wild west exactly exactly it is the wild west of, of star wars it's and so, rides man okay 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 so there are two rides and as you may have heard rise of the resistance which if you I've said on this podcast, the one I was more excited for when they first announced mm -hmm. it. And I think that's the one the Imagineers are actually more proud of. That's not open yet. It's going to open in the Florida Galaxy's Edge in Walt Disney World later this year. And then early next year, it will be open in Disneyland. But you saw where it was under construction? And yes, we saw the lines. And that is in the resistance part, right directly across from where that X-Wing is. Okay. That's where. So not very populated right now, that part of Galaxy's Edge. Uh, but smaller is run. So... You walk up and there's the Falcon. Like, no matter which entrance you come in from, any of the three entrances, you walk far enough and you will see the Millennium Falcon. Does it, it is, feel life size? It is 100% life size. Really? It is awesome. Wow. You can't go to like directly underneath it. Like, the, there are parts that are still cordoned off, but like, you are really close up yeah. there. You're looking up and the Falcon is right there. You feel like you're in Moss Eisley. The docking bay and the Falcon is right there, Jeez. and it looks really good. And it is so like, detailed, big, like super detailed. Yeah. They, they know the side of the Falcon, the side of the the mandrels uh, where all the Greedleys are. That is like front and center. That's like at, at nighttime when yeah. lights come on. It's gorgeous. And the cockpit is lit, but no one's in it. I assume. C yes, exactly. Okay, and that is not the the Falcon. Like a lot of people are wondering, is that the Falcon you go in or on mm -hmm. for the ride? Right. It's not. It's a static model. It's just the display piece in front of the ride area. Fine. Totally fine. So I did a diagram based on what, uh, what 
I understood after doing the ride twice to be how it works. And I'll talk about the actual ride experience at the end of this. So, An hour long wait for both? Uh, no, no, no. I, we did fast pass for one, got and it. then we got a hookup for the second one. Sweet. Yeah. Thank you, Disney friends, Disneyland cast members. So there's a, I, I put this image up on Twitter. If you're not watching the video and you're just listening to the, the podcast, you can look up my Twitter history, and I did a sketch on our whiteboard outside. But I'm going to reference that now as a, as a diagram to how I believe the, the Falcon it rides smugglers run works because I, I assume you guys are interested in it from, from an imagineering standpoint from a from a ride standpoint right because we was at, we talked on a podcast I mean I'll, it sounds like I have to take out a second mortgage before going here but yes I'm very <laughs> interested but like you know uh, we were super skeptical when they announced a ride that one put, would put you in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon two would be fully interactive basically you could fly the Falcon and three could then accommodate uh, the forty four thousand people that go to Disneyland right. every day. Okay. Right? Because how could that possibly work? Tell us. So you have the Static Falcon here, and the line is on to the left side of it. And I put a one hour mark, so that's about one hour from that part. Now, they designed the ride that the line, the line never goes in front of the Falcon. The line is always behind the Falcon. It actually goes to a crew area over to the right side. And you get funneled in, and you go through a winding area where there are a lot of just great things to look at. You have uh, a lot of other Star Cruisers. You have like Ray's, a uh, version of Ray's pod, like the set deck, the theming inside, as with all of the other Disney line rides, are plenty of photo opportunities. So then after about an hour's wait, you are inside the building, basically inside the hangar that the, the Falcon is docked into. And that's when you walk inside the building. And you then you get split off into one room, into two sides of the room. And I might even have a photo of this. Uh, I label this as a box right in the middle and have a dotted line because you get side to the right side or the left side. I believe about 60 people or so are loaded into this room. And at the top of my diagram here, I have this little figure um, behind a, like a, a railing. Now, I do have a photo. That is the animatronic of uh, the fear. That's right here. And this is an amazing animatronic. He's the guy who has leased the Falcon from Chewie to borrow the Falcon to do... A, a smuggling run. It's a Johnny Depp looking. Yeah, he, like, he's, he uh, has like braided hair. He has goggles on. He's basically the jar, uh, the job of the hut of this this world, right? He's the one who is contracting out smugglers to steal things for him. To go on, in this case, to go on an attack run against the Empire to steal some. Uh, what's the thing from Solo? The, uh, the 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 fuel, the fuel rods, the explosive fuel rods, and so. Uh, He's wonderfully anim animated. He's elevated above you, so you never see his feet. You never see how you know how how locked in he is to the ground. But he kind of glides from left to right, and he has a wonderful keep live animation. He looks around and he gives you a briefing. Uh, and and again, this is a way to kind of make the line experience more interactive. So he tells you about the mission. He tells you about where you are. He does a little video uh, chat he does with Chewie. And then the reason you're split in the left side and the right side of the room is then. You, those two groups basically go to two different Falcons, two different staging areas. And this calls back to uh, Star Trek The Experience, which we've talked about on the show before. This was the Las Vegas uh, Hilton ride for Star Trek. And remember, uh, that wasn't 40,000 people a day. That was probably a couple hundred, a couple thousand people a day. But for that Star Trek interactive immersive experience, which this actually reminded me a lot of, they built two Enterprise D bridges, right? They had Basically, they, they could stack them and run them concurrently. They had two shuttle rides, two, two crew or you know, cast members, cr or cr or groups of cast, and two bridges. And one they can also then rent out for weddings or parties or whatever. Right? So in the same way, if you go back then to my Twitter diagram, this splits off left and right to two interiors of the Millennium Falcon. And this is where things get interesting. Where after you get your briefing, you are then grouped into groups of six. And it may be single riders, you may be only, you know, I, I went with uh, my friend who, um, who I went with there. You know, the, we took turns where the babies waited outside and I, I waited with the babies. Well, you found a random kid to go with. Yeah, yeah, got yeah exactly. Got it. So we, uh, and then you walk, it's not a ramp, you're already docked. So you just kind of go through a doorway and then you are in 
the main compartment hold of the Falcon. I have a little, little sketch here. That's the Jajaric chest table. You're in that main area where the chest table is. And this is with about 30 people, right? Because it's the 60 people split into two. Can you touch the chest table? You can. This is a fully, Whoa. fully interactive waiting area. Think of it as a waiting room. And you're in the waiting room where you can see the bunk beds, you know, the classic little uh, oval bunk uh, oval bed areas right uh there's the chess room there are lots of fo- places it's not terribly big i'd say maybe as big as like four times the size of this podcast room maybe the size of like the tested office right it's enough to fit 30 people but you don't have you can't like move you can't it's not spacious. It's not spacious. Yeah. Uh, it. But it's great selfie opportunities. And at that point, you've been grouped in these groups of six. And they give you your grouping by giving you a little um, uh, a, a card, essentially, a boarding pass, right? And the boarding pass has a color on it, which denotes your group. So the yellow group, red group, orange group, purple group, blue group. And then also your designation of what your role is, whether it's two pilots, two gunners, and two engineers so you're a red five of course the best we got i got orange orange oh. or uh, orange pilot so in this staging area with about 30 people each that's about i th- assume like five groups of 30 people i think there are five different colors it's just back with napkin math i did and then you you if you're an early group that gets called up then you get less time to hang out here. I wanted more time to hang out here. Now, one of the cool things is there are interactive elements here. Random times throughout the day, alarm bells will go off. And there are panels with then flashing lights. And then one of the crew members, one of the cast will say, oh, someone go push that red button over there. Turn off that alarm. And then, you know, if you're by, oh, okay, press the red button. You press the red button and and then everything settles. So there's a little bit of that kind of interactivity there. But once your group is called up, your six people are called up, then you go down another hallway. And if you think of the Falcon, you're now going down the neck to where the cockpit is. And the door opens, and there's the cockpit. And you get inside, your gunner, you take your your seats. Thank you, Kishore, for finding the right picture right there. And then you go on a five-minute ride. So you got your group of six. You got all your cards. Are you allowed to exchange? Like, I want to be the pilot. You could. I, I want to be the engineer. It, it, it's within your six. It's, okay. And you're allowed to do that. You're and then, absolutely allowed then you, to do that. How do you know what seat is yours? The front two are always the two pilots. Mm-hmm. The middle two are always the gunners. And the back two are always the engineers. Oh, so there's two of each. So you're and, a gunner? No. Pilot both times. What? So you ruined some kid's day by being pilot both times? No. They have plenty of opportunities themselves. I was randomly, the, the trick to getting a pilot is getting in the front of the staging area with the 60 people. If you're in the front there, the first two cards they hand out to you are always the pilot cards. They hand them out in that order. Pilot, wow. gunner, engineer. But so you only know what it's like to be a pilot. I do. That's a problem. No, not a problem. <laughs> Pilot's the best seat. <laughs> so in the Falcon, and then you have 30 seconds. The way they time this onboarding is you have 30 seconds to put on your seatbelt and get ready. And the crew's like, yeah, 30 seconds before takeoff. Yeah. You gotta do this in 30 seconds. Everyone's like, oh, oh. There's no like baskets like Star Tours used to have to put your backpacks. They should do that on United. People get there on time. Yeah, you have 30 seconds. Everyone's like, oh, it's okay, okay. And then check, check, check. And then the door closes behind you and the mission starts. Now, if you go back to my Twitter picture, the question is how many people can you get through this ride at yep. once? <laughs> And so if you think about it, they have two staging areas of 30 people. I heard that there are, for each of the staging areas, a carousel of 18 Falcon cockpits that move on on a rail that then lock in with the staging area. 18 each? So 36. Is that true? I don't know. Okay, you just heard it. This is hearsay. Yeah, there's a lot of hearsay. I I would love for Imagineers to reach out and confirm this for me. 36 cockpits. Each cockpit is on its own motion controlled, basically simulator. Spared no expense. Right? And then it's real time rendering with an array of graphics cards, server enterprise graphics cards. Unreal, Nvidia, Unreal Engine based. Unreal right? Engine based. Yeah. It's, so I think they're quadros. And then running, I want to say, um, five 4K projectors stitched. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So it's not 3D. It's not 3D. No glasses. No time to onboard glasses. No, sorry. Of course yeah. not. Yeah. So tell me about it. So it 
here's where there's a minor complaint. It went by really fast. Oh, yeah? I think they chose interactivity. And when, it's, when the ride is going, it is fully interactive. You have things to do. And because you have things to do, it goes by faster than you think. So what do you do? So you fly off of the planet. Spoiler alert. Yeah, I know. There's a minor spoiler. There are videos you can watch on YouTube where people have filmed the entire ride. But you got to go fly off the planet. Now, the way the, the pilots are, are arranged yeah. is one pilot has a lever that controls left and right. And one pilot has a lever that controls up and down movement. Oh. You got to work together that way. Mm. Oh, that's plenty cool. Plenty of obstacles. Yeah. yeah. But the right pilot is the best pilot, the one that goes up and down. Okay. Because that pilot also pulls the lever that goes to light speed. Punch uh, it. Which punch it. It gets you punch it. Should, yeah. And every you, you, you got to yell punch it. Yell punch it every time. <laughs> Did you yell punch yeah, it? Yeah, of course. Punch it. Punch it. And then pulling that metal, you know, machine uh, yeah. handle that, yeah. that then pull and you get light speed twice. So to, to be fair, somebody else should yell punch it. That's and true. And then that's you true. Punch I, yeah, it. I can't, can't help myself. Couldn't help myself. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're there. You're in, you're in the Falcon. Um, so what is everyone else doing? So you're chasing down these transport ships. Okay to try to steal the fuel and uh, the, the gunners are shooting down t- um, uh, TIE fighters. Everyone's looking out the front. Everyone's cockpit. looking out the front. Do the gunners don't have like their little LCD displays with no. the, the red? No. Okay. Yeah. Everyone's looking out. I, actually, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I, never, I, I never did <laughs> the, the gunner. It's a problem. Yeah. But I presume everyone's looking out the front. The okay. gunners are shooting the, uh, the TIE fighters yeah. and shooting at the transport vehicles and get them to drop the, the two fuel canisters or, that you can pick up. And the engineers are pushing buttons that are lighting up throughout the experience. Oh, that sounds that horrible. Then I, well, you do it too. As a pilot, there are buttons that you press for braking. And oh. You press for, like, you, there's like quick time events. When, okay. So happen. when they light up, you hit them. And when they light up, you hit them. Or your score goes down. Oh. And they give you a score at the end. There's a whole debriefing at the end where you get like a score. One group score. One group score. They tell you how much repair you did, how much damage you did. Got it. How many uh, fuel you captured. And so that's the replayability aspect of it. It looks fantastic. It looks pre-rendered, even though it's real time. Yeah. And it is ex- almost exactly five minutes. <laughs> and so if you do the math, 36 pods, six people, 12 times an hour, they can get through at capacity like 35, 36,000 people a day. When you're going to hyperspace, do you feel it? Like, yeah, is it, there acceleration? It, it, and yeah, stuff? And I mean, just like Star Tours had the same thing, right? Star Tours is a yeah. little bit of a, a pull you. So, back is there and, like in, some intensity to this? It's not very intense, mm. right? There's, it's, it's very Star Tours like. Like your 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 backpacks and your camera bags, you're not putting in lockers or pouches. So it's not like Mission Space Orange, which no, is more no, 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 intense. No. There's there's no gravitron aspect. To it's it. at Epcot and Disney World. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no G. You're not pulling any Gs. Got it. But the reason why you, you think that the that the pilot is the best seat is because you are essentially controlling the you motion get, control. Exactly. You get the most control of crashing the things if you want that. But you're also controlling the actual and you movement also of the get, ship. Exactly. You also get to. Uh, Make yeah. everyone sick. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so when you bumped into something, you go, that was too close. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't. I mean, it goes by so fast. Even the second time, we're going to chance to enjoy some of the, the graphics a little more. Yeah. My recommendation is if you get an engineer seat, you can ask for auto mode or you can, honestly, it doesn't matter. There are video clips of people who've done this entire ride not touching any of the six controls. You finish it no matter what. In, in five minutes? Of course you do. Always like, five minutes. Is it always the same length? Always about the same length. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So you could do the whole thing. I would say if you're an engineer, see it. Yeah, push the buttons if you want, but enjoy the scenery. Enjoy the ride. Right? I think that when you're fully in, when, when your attention is split into all these mechanisms and buttons, you, you appreciate the visuals less, and that made the ride seem less like a ride to me. Hmm. That's my only complaint. Okay. Yeah. Um, Good recap. But that, that Smuggler's Run, highly recommended. I mean, the theming across that entire land was so good. I think they could have charged, like, if you think of how much they charged for, like, the Void, you know, and like, the VR experiences, and, like, they could have charged easily 50 bucks <laughs> just for Galaxy's Edge. So, wait, is that the only ride in Galaxy's Edge right now? 
The, Remember, the lightsaber and the droid are considered oh, attractions. Those are attractions. But the smuggler's run is the e-ticket ride, and the rise of the resistance it will be the other ride. Right, and and also notably included in your admission fee. Included in the yeah. admission fee. Whereas the lightsaber and mm, robot are exactly. not. If you want to wait in line, get your fast pass. Do those two rides. Take your photos. There's so much stuff. They get you with all the stuff to buy. Now, my big now it goes back to my big regret. No. Let's let's go back to the photos. Let's go to. Uh, Let's go to the Coke cans. Let's go to the bottles. This is breaking news. This is news from this morning. You could buy a bottle of Sprite or Coke that looks like a thermal detonator. Mm -hmm. It looks so good. And it has... Why am I not holding one in my hand right now? Because it was $5.50. Okay. For that. Would have paid for that. I I know. I know. I decided to get a regular just... A, a, a large cup of Coke for three dollars <laughs> instead, three fifty instead, and, and get hydrated or refreshed. Uh, just announced today, TSA is banning this item oh. from carry-ons from or carry-ons. altogether. I think from just from carry-ons. Okay, it's on eBay for thirty bucks, Kishore. So. No, thank you. All right, mm-hmm. I will make a request for my friends who live in Anaheim next time they go to get a few of these and, and bring them up. <laughs> Got to smuggle them up, though. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's the Galaxy Edge recap. Um, and let's go to th- our top story. <laughs> <laughs> top story this week. All right. D23. Oh, good. I was <laughs> hoping it would be Disney stuff. Let's talk more Disney stuff. It's the Disney cast this week. I, th- I was so bummed for missing out the podcast last week with like all that Spider-Man talk and the Matrix talk, but it turns out there was a lot more to talk about because the team at Disney, Disney Animation Studios, mm-hmm. Pixar, mm-hmm. Marvel Studios, Lucasfilm, all had things to announce, but no bigger thing than the mm-hmm. Disney Parks Department. Oh, really? Because now we know. Oh, no. That's not a no, top story. No. That's our pop culture news. What are you I, talking I about? Forgot. We're talking about the movie. We're, oh, geez. I'm completely out of sorts. First, we got the poster. Yeah. Okay. Which Rise is up Skywalker. on the screen. There we go. Uh, I think it's a mostly good poster. I didn't love like the emperor looming over it. It what? feels Why not? a little cartoony to me. Um, but Ray and Kylo kind of fighting on what I think is a remnant of the Death Star. Death Star 2, yeah. Um, they gave that poster away also at D23 after the panel, and those are going up on eBay for like 50 bucks. Really? Yeah. I like I how this looks. Yeah, it, it, it's a cool poster. I, I don't think this is what the poster we'll see in theaters. I think this is just a special D23 no, poster. No, I mean, we'll get one of those standard Star Wars posters. Yes, with lot, everybody. All the heads, yeah. exactly. So um, let's talk about the trailer, yeah, though. So our top story is The Rise of Skywalker. Not out. I don't think it's a trailer. It it's is, like a special look. Yeah, yeah, it's a special. It's a special D twenty three look. Now, here's the the caveat: uh, if you are one hundred percent spoiler averse and you don't want to see or hear about the footage, skip ahead for five to ten minutes because we're going to be talking about this footage and we're going to be showing it on, on the behind. Oh, it's already TV. playing. It's playing right now. So, uh, and my takeaway from this is: if this is the last thing I saw of the Rise of Skywalker before trailer two comes out, I'm not. I can go and not watch trailer two and just wait till December and watch the movie because this is plenty. I'm with you on that. Look at how beautiful the old footage is in this. Like Vader just on the deck of the ship. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. forget at how beautiful a shot that is. I don't think about Star Wars in that way. Well, it's, all, it's special edition footage too. It's touched up. It looks good. It's not the rescanned 4K footage. No. no. So this is, uh, it opens up, of course, you've probably seen this, but it opens up with a lot of recap, a lot of, old footage from the original trilogy and even the prequel trilogy. You got Darth Maul, you got Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, you got every, Anakin, you got... Star Wars movie, yep, yeah. yep, yep, yep. You got uh, Padme, even you got... Uh, and then you got Vader and the Emperor. So it kind of Trade sets it disputes. up. Trade disputes. Let's and get then, in there. Yes, then then it recaps Force Awakens. You got some shots from Last Jedi. There goes BB-8. And then the new footage comes in. And this is all vo- voiceover from Luke's there voiceover. It is. And so you got to pause it, you got to pause it, you got to pause it. This Christmas, <laughs> halfway through, it. right there. Good job, Kishore. 
<laughs> let's go through this. Uh, not exactly shot by shot, but like you know, mostly, right? You go, we we've read the Vanity Fair story the interviews, and yeah. we've read like we've seen the first trailer. We know there are gonna be some new worlds. It's gonna be an adventure film. The gang's gonna be all together, and you get you get exactly that, right? You get. The sense of, yep, you get, get Poe's new outfit. They're in this crazy, colorful world. You have a glimpse of Leia, that mm -hmm. unused footage from Force Awakens. And then, oh, oh, oh those two shots. Get, stop, stop, stop. You got the, the, the first two things that blow people's mind. One, the remnants of the Resistance Armada that come in. And, of course, everyone's shouting out the B-Wing. Nice. And then you got in this dark cloud mm -hmm. nebula. What is this? A, a, a cloud in the sky? A, a lightning storm in space? Uh, it's a fleet of hundreds of Star Destroyers. In perfect formation. And these aren't fir First Order Star Destroyers. It looks like these are Imperial Star Destroyers. Hiding out this whole what time? What are they doing? Who made them? Is this going to be an Attack of the clone style? There was a secret plan all, all along, and an the, the Emperor has been building an army? What's going on? Don't know. Don't know. Okay, that's a cool shot. Then you get... Uh, you get okay. Here's the other big one. You got C3PO with red eyes, or as internet has dubbed him, Creepio. <laughs> <laughs> What's going this on? This is just red alert, C3PO. Yeah, I he, don't. I don't think anything nefarious. He's in is some happening. type of. It uh, doesn't look like an imperial ship, but some type of repair facility. He's being experimented on. He's just coming out of his oil bath. Maybe he's become a spy, like Jordy in Star Trek Generations. And so they, they made his, his visor eyes red. Yeah, I that'd be the worst tell. Well, maybe that's, <laughs> that would be. I was excited to see it because it made me think. Well, Adam's going to have to modify his three PO now. Nice. It's going to be lenses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A whole new personality. Oh, and we'll we'll stop there. Random tangent. I will have to say, because of D twenty three, a lot of people were there. A lot of celebrities were there. And the day I was at Galaxy's Edge, I did. I was standing just three feet away from Anthony Daniels. Wow, you smelled him. And I looked at my family and I said I'm not going to take a picture I'm not going to ask for a picture I, I'm not even and then as I said mm -hmm. I'm it's a very meta moment I didn't tell you guys this but I, I, I was there's a lot of angst I was debating it did I want to be that guy to take a picture yep. and ask and I saw hashtags later or people had posted on Instagram taking pictures with him at Galaxy's Edge so was he just shopping no he was with his family and he wasn't he was with Fans. No, no, no. Okay. He was, I think, with his uh, his family, and I think he uh, one of the Disney tour guys were like special gotcha. cast members gotcha. were giving him a tour, but not enough people action. recognized him for him to be swarmed. Exactly, and I didn't want to. You didn't want to be that guy, yeah, 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 yeah. To, to get to, to freak. And then the moment I said, "Oh, I'm not even going to be that guy to hold my camera <laughs> up and take a stealth selfie," right. My wife then Danica said, "Hey, look, that someone over there is taking a picture of you." And there was another person at Galaxy's Edge doing a stealth selfie mm -hmm. of me. Nice, and stealthy. Moment. Yeah, we yeah. want to see that. Yeah. Uh, tangent upon tangent. Okay. Best underrated Twitter war right now is our friend Anthony Carboni, who's host a Star Wars show. Yes. And Anthony Daniels are in like a fake Twitter beef right oh. now because Anthony Daniels broke their droid on the Star Wars show <gasps> this week. It is fantastic Twitter fodder. Okay. All right. Keep going. All right. Okay. Next shot in here, we have a blast of some kind. It yes. does look like a star killer blast yep. of some kind, not same, a Death same Star shade blast. Of red, yep. Yeah. We don't think Star Killer 2. No way, right? So you got then a sequence where Ray is kind of frustrated, angry, and she's throwing. Oh, uh, if you go back, she's throwing her lightsaber mm -hmm. through trees. Yes. And almost missing. Whoa. A training. A training droid. Good stuff, It Kishore. looks like a training sequence. It also looks like this would is where you, Leia is. Would you say this is almost a forest moon? <laughs> it, that, that's a very astute observation. But yeah, this I, I, I predict this is probably very soon after the events of, or this is one of the early scenes where she's mastering her force powers, and maybe this is where she sees Leia. Because mm. there's a hugging scene that we see. We saw it from the first trailer. Okay, Kylo Ren with his new TIE fighter, his new TIE interceptor. He's walking on what looks like rocky terrain. It looks cold, looks Helmet dark. on, I believe. Helmet on, yes. Yeah, he soldered that thing back together. Yeah, you know, nothing like, you know, the, the, the metaphor of destroying the past. 
that Ryan Johnson had pushed so hard for in Last Jedi, and then J.J. Abrams literally welding back together the helmet of Kylo Ren and putting it on him to, to bring it back to his vision. All right, let's continue. Cool execution of the, his, his lightsaber, and then they're on. You, can, you know this is Death Star 2. Go back, go back, go back. You know they're fighting on these watery Death Star 2 because you have, like, in the back, the, the, you have the same type of debris that we saw in the first trailer, and also you see one of the gun turrets over on the left side. That's a classic gun turret on the surface of the Death Star. Now, uh, keen-eyed uh, Redditors have also pointed out that this effect shot, clearly an effect shot, uh, is incomplete because in the reflection... Uh, that you see underneath Kylo Ren, he has no cape, and yet his cape is fully there. <laughs> and so the cape is CG. ILM artists just need to make sure they replicate that CG cape in the water <laughs> or, reflection. Or is as this well. like a standard Marvel misdirect oh. where where we're seeing footage in a trailer, quote unquote, oh. that isn't actually going to be what's in the final? Or some type of metaphor where the cape represents his dark side and in the reflection. It's like Dracula it doesn't yeah. show up. There you go. Uh, and then, of course, the final shot of the trailer after you hear Ian McDermott's uh, voice, the Emperor's voice. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Yes. <laughs> that was more count. That was shot. Yeah. Yeah. I, was <laughs> I, was stuck, I got stuck on Dracula. You have Oop. Evil yes. Ray with the fold-out lightsaber, which, of course, people have pointed out is not new. It's been in Clone Wars or Rebels. Um, and well, it's, it's new to the films. New to the films, for oh, sure. Yeah. And it is Dark, dark Ray. So are we going to theorize? What are we going to do? Um, it, it, she's not dark. I just whatever it is, she's she doesn't go dark. It just it wouldn't make sense to me. Vision, just yeah. like in uh, on Dagobah. So there are theories that are so good that people have, and people have written about these that I'm uh, hesitant to mention them on the podcast because yeah. I don't want to incept the idea into listen our listeners' heads because it may ruin the actual spoiler. I mean, this is the problem with internet speculation today. The theories become so good that we, either we've gotten too the smart that that I mean, well, it's a crowd of people combining all of their theories together. Yeah, it's true. It's true. The theory. I, I mean, should I just talk about the theory I subscribe to the most? Um, does it involve the redemption of Kylo Ren? No. Hmm. Yeah, go for it. The theory that I subscribe to the most that it's it's not Ray, nor is it a vision, but that Ray is a clone. And that's another clone. Hmm. Ray is a clone, like mm -hmm. a one of many. A one of many, because mm -hmm. you have in the Last Jedi when she tries to see the vision of who her parents are, she sees nothing but a reflection of herself, mm -hmm. along with that long line mm -hmm. of. And the Emperor other rays. has been f growing clones of of a Jedi. Maybe are we finally getting like the genetic story in Star Wars that? The scientist inside me has always wanted. <laughs> I mean, we had Attack of the Clones. Cloning is a big part of the Star Wars mythology. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I subscribe to that most is if you look at her face, she's very, like, dead-eyed. Mm -hmm. Right. Which could go with the vision theory, but it could also go with, like, this is a, Ray with ner a version of Ray with no personality because groomed to just be a Sith Lord. Kay. Who knows? I dig it. All right. All right. So that's the big story this week. Rise of Skywalker. Bit of footage from D23. Of course, they had a big panel, introduced a bunch of characters, but now it comes out December. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're not going to talk about box office predictions. All right. Shall we, shall we then move on? Keep the Disney cast rolling. Let's do it. Okay, now we can talk about the other things announced at D23. Yes, you got Pixar, you got Soul, you got Disney Animation Studios with Raza, The Last Dragon. You got Lucasfilm with, oh, Obi-Wan, oh my goodness. And you got Marvel Studios with three new TV shows. We'll but get to those. Let's talk about the Halcyon. All right, this is the Disney Parks announcement. Long rumored, proven to be true, but built out sometime in maybe the not-too-distant future will be a galactic cruiser experience. So the hotel is a spaceship? The hotel is a spaceship. I love it. But exterior-wise, I don't know if they're actually going to build Yeah, what, what will that be like? Will they make so, it like a, like a, like you board a shuttle? 
That's the idea. So they actually detailed a lot more than I thought they would. The whole onboarding experience will be two days bookended. Yeah. It's a vacation within a vacation. If you're going to spend a week and a half at Disney World, a week at Disney World, well, you can spend an additional amount of money to do this two-day stay at, oh, no, what's, what's going on, Kishore? I don't know. You, you fix this. <laughs> uh, two-day stay at uh, on board the Halcyon um, inner immersive experience. Mm-hmm. Now, I, there are a lot of pluses about this and a lot, lot of, like, potential for this. You do board a shuttle, then you board the Halcyon. They did, there's concept art of a, of a new uh, Star Cruiser terminal. After you go to the launch pod, there's a new uh, atrium area, the main atrium, where you're going to have stormtroopers, and you're going to have, yeah, you're going to have, there's a picture of Chewie there, even. And so then you Poor get assigned Chewie. to your He's rooms. Like taking, carrying luggage around. Exactly. Maybe, 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 not, maybe not chewy exactly, but then you'll get taken to your room, and presumably these rooms will be nice. They're called it's a luxury liner. It's kind of like uh, the Fifth Element that that you know the the big Star Cruiser there, except you're not in sleep pods. Maybe you'll actually get a room with beds. But on those two days, you'll have scheduled activities. You can wander yeah. the ship as you as you please. It's going to be like a cruise that never leaves port. One hundred percent. Where they'll have performances. They'll have interactive uh, lightsaber battles that you can do lightsaber training. You'll have a designated time when you have to go onto the bridge. And learn about the Halcyon. Now, all the windows will be will have some type of <laughs> window, you know, some type yeah. of screen right. or projector or some type of thing that will give you some sense of where you are in space and the fact that you are in space. But for potentially for two full days, yes. people will not receive one ounce of sunlight. They will be inside. That's yes. so true. That is very true. That is that is true. <laughs> that's why. Maybe, that's maybe why this it's capped to two days. Disney sunlight overrated. <laughs> <laughs> what if there's a uh, there's no ho- holodeck in, uh, in Star Wars, but like there's got to be some some force level where you can pretend some, to be at yeah. Disneyland. Yeah. Well, oh no, no, I'm sorry, it, you're you're incorrect there. Mm. The reason there will be sunlight over yeah. two days, and one of the I see this as maybe one of the downsides of this potential experience, is you'll be going on excursions to Galaxy's Edge to Batu. What? Yeah, but you have to. Presumably, it is an option. I, it, you know what you have to pay to be at this hotel. And I, 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 if, I, if I, I'm I paying that, speculate. I am not intending to go to Galaxy's Edge. That's, my, that's the downside, <laughs> right? Maybe you have to cut the line, but they're making a visit to Galaxy's Edge yeah. part of the two days, which I think is kind of, that's not a great way to Here, do it. Here's what I want. I want lower decks. They do. Now, did you see there's a picture of engineering? That you can explore engineering and meet some of the crew, and you can even find places and, and see secret meetings and Ooh, hear yeah. conversations and learn about things that you aren't supposed to learn about. And at some point, I think the ship will be attacked, and you will have to defend against the attack. Oh, really? Yeah. So everybody staying at the hotel is involved in a big, like, military operation. Some some event. Maybe there'll be like a, a boarding, right? Like the stormtroopers aboard. The question hmm. is, will all the rooms rumble? Will they oh. have interactive? Vibration rumbling. The whole, on, hotel, on the whole hotel is an animatronic. Right? <laughs> it's on a gimbal. <laughs> or is it just designated areas? Probably just designated areas. So I think it's, it's, it's a cool concept. I want there to be a lot of writing. I, want, I mean, I, I assume they'll have a lot of cast members, a lot of crew. Mm-hmm. It may even be that, you know, however many rooms they book, they could have two of these running concurrently. Right, just like they do with the other rides. What do you mean? So like, so you know, if you've booked for the this Friday and Saturday, you're going to the hotel and you're doing this whole thing, but at the same time, they have a group doing Saturday Sunday at a different really? exact simulation. That's hard to imagine because the, if it's really an orchestrated, you know, event it's series of, of events, it's just it's just going on the script. It's you, like you can have two Broadway presentations of Hamilton at the same time in theaters, but it sounds to me like the whole hotel becomes. Rip, how big is that hotel? You can't have a thousand people. Doing this all at once, yeah. my assumption it's more like if two hundred people. If there's an invasion, yeah. everyone in the hotel is going to have to know about it. That's my thought. In the lobby, essentially. How big is that atrium? Right, I don't know. Right, is this more? But like I imagine that you're wandering camp through size, it all the time. or is it really cruise size? These are the questions that we don't have the answers Still, to. Still, anyway, what what would be the point if you have X number of rooms, you're going to fill them in either scenario? Yeah, it, you will. So, well, depending on the price. The price per room is rumored to be in the thousands, and if it's like, I could see this being like three thousand dollars a night. Do you think Disney's gonna? 
a room or a, a, for experience. Disney just miscalculated with Galaxy's Edge. Do you think that could be the same thing Well, here? then we could all hope for the coupon days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, would you pay $3,000 for, for this for your family? No. Not per person, but like per two days? <laughs> no. No. Not $9,000. Not $9,000 or <laughs> oh, for two days three. over a night. <laughs> no. You don't... Well, think of it this way. Like a night at one of the nice Disney resorts can be up to like five hundred or six hundred dollars a night. Or yeah. or get this, I can pay rent. That's true. <laughs> That's true. It's r- it is a lot of money. I it thought they did post the prices. Did they not? I don't think they did. Somebody, no. somebody worked it out where uh, they had the, the what I thought was the official price for a group rate yeah. of like six people. And if you break that down, you could go for uh, like three hundred bucks a night per person. That's and still that again. That's about a couple thousand dollars. Yeah, but still, it's expensive. It's very expensive. Yeah, yeah. but it, it, it does get down to like cheaper cruise rates. I mean, there are like a lot of Disney hotels on property that are obviously not at this level that are like four hundred bucks a night. Yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm I'm not surprised if this will be, you know, eight hundred to a thousand dollars. I'm a night. I'm very curious about it. Like I would love to do it. It really like ever since you got me to watch the first season of Westworld, and then they came up with this idea. Like I'm very intrigued by it, and I'm enticed by it. But I'll look Coupon forward. Day. I'll look forward to seeing what people think about it first. Yes, they are building it in both locations, right? No, just Florida. It's just Florida. It's that's okay. where that's where they have the space. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, if well, if you can't get enticed by the Galactic Cruiser, how about Avengers Campus? Interested. This is basically so Disney cannot in Disneyland have a Marvel Land. Because of the Universal contract, especially uh, west of, uh, east of the Mississippi. Uh, Universal Studios still has their Marvel area. So instead of that, they have the Avengers brand. And this is going to be essentially Avengers land. They're building in California Adventure. They're getting rid of the Bugs Life stuff. They're connecting it to the Guardians of the Galaxy ride that replaced the Tower of Terror. And it is the campus. It's going to be the, the Avengers recruiting, looking for recruits for new superheroes. And they did announce a Spider-Man ride. This I actually think I'm I'm more excited about the Avengers Campus just because the Spider Man ride's gonna be dynamic. You don't say. It looked like <laughs> it looked like there's gonna be uh, some type of 3D glasses involved with maybe some type of AR, you know, sp- spider web shooting that you do. Wait, wasn't there already an Amazing Spider Man ride somewhere in Universal Studios? Yeah. Yeah. Universal has one. Has it's a, I like it. it the, after they updated it, it's it has great. An, oh, the one that's in Florida hasn't been updated, and it's no, no, really, Florida has been updated. But it's old. But when it, it came is. out, it was really cutting it. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. The ride has been updated, but not the experience going oh, into the ride. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah, pretty... Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's cartoony. Great. Very cartoony. So there's going to be a new... Um, sorry, uh, Spider-Man ride. There's going to be a, um, <laughs> Dr. Pym's Test Kitchen. And they had some of this at D23 where they the giant food. So it'll be a, a whole restaurant with giant food and bite tiny food. That they can charge you a lot of money for. And then also, in the future, they're going to do another uh, uh, Wakanda-based ride. And they haven't talked about it. They said it's going to be completely different. The concept art shows people in kind of like individual chairs that are, that are launched with rockets underneath them. So I'm it here for doesn't any, look like a dark ride. Something that combines technology and nature together. Yeah. That would be amazing. They already have the Guardians of the Galaxy ride. And that's going to... I mean, the, that's just the, the anchor for that whole thing, yeah. right? Yeah, when it launches and next I year. Think, next I think year. they're going to make a Guardians coaster in Orlando. Yeah. Uh, shall we talk about uh, Disney Plus news or some, how about yeah. some movie news? Disney Plus is Disney Plus. Okay, Disney Plus, as you may know, coming November 12th. I've already signed up. Can you do that? I did too. How do you do that? There, there's a oh, search online. Hmm. Yeah, I've signed up for a three year. Oh, you did a three year commit? Yeah. Wait, did you save money that way? I did. Save money that right. way. All right. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, but $7 a month, they've announced that that includes multiple streams, four, four. streams. Yeah. And then... Including 4K. 4K. Wow. Aggressive pricing. Yeah. $70 a year. They really, really want these to come out. And in addition to all the shows that we saw announced at Comic-Con Hall H, there are even more shows. Let's talk about the Marvel stuff first. On the Marvel side, well, you got She Hulk. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Ms. Marvel, mm-hmm. which will bleed into the movies. 
Yeah, and it it'll probably be more of like a high school kind of uh, younger set show. And Moon Knight. Moon no Knight. No one saw this coming. Moon Knight. Woo. I actually really excited about I that one. What you it. can do with Mark Spector. Oh, Moon Knight is basically Batman, except he's truly psychotic and he hallucinates and thinks that he's speaking to an Egyptian moon god. Okay. And how does that help the humanity? He mm. basically is like a Batman style, super rich dude who fights crime. But he's like tripping the whole time. But he's tripping the whole time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. She-Hulk going to be a lawyer in this? Yes. I hope it's based on the Dan Slott She-Hulk run, where the way you do She-Hulk is you got to have a good Jennifer Walters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think she'll be She-Hulk yeah. the entire time. I don't think we've gotten the type of performance cap, real-time rendering technology where you can have, you know, they're not going to paint someone green and, and do that, but it'll, it'll probably be CG. But they're confident, and it'll be, it'll be very different. You know, do, do a 30 Rock style She-Hulk. When do we I get watch to watch that? <laughs> when do we get to see She-Hulk? Uh, I think. Did, did they announce dates? They, on I don't them? think they announced no. dates. No, okay. So they're yeah. just saying it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. So give us your money now. Yeah, got it. Yeah, and then uh, on the Lucasfilm side, you had the first public trailer for The Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. This is better than the than the uh, Rise of Skywalker. Rise of Skywalker. Well, footage. that's funny because the f- there was a leaked trailer from The Mandalorian that you probably never saw because mm-hmm. um, it was like taken down really quickly yeah you can find copies of it online um but yeah full scenes and that came out i think around the same time that the that the the trailer for the new star wars film came out yeah Um, star wars celebration yeah 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 and now it's happening again but i agree with you and i I agreed with you back then too just the the scene setting of the of the world with like the stormtrooper helmets on like pikes and just a buried on the ground yeah it's hardcore seeing the mando walk up the end scene with Werner freaking Herzog at that table. Whew. Yeah. I'm, Ch- I'm all in on that show. I mean, I think they have the visual look uh, calls back to Rogue One a little yep. bit in terms of the, uh, the, the tattooiness of it all. Uh, and the fact that they've pulled in a bunch of different directors. Taika Waititi's directing an episode. Mm-hmm. John Favreau, of course. Uh, Bryce Dallas Howard's coming to direct an episode. Like, there's some really interesting creative direction for this. So while it ha- might have a visual continuity, the episodes will be different, and the supporting cast, I think, will make this show. You have that IG-88-style droid, that one shot with him, with this blasters out. That's going to be so cool. What do you think about them announcing that they're going to release this on a weekly basis instead of in a binge Great. mode? Great. Fantastic. Totally fine. I, I, I like it. I'm, I, I'm done with binging. I can't do it. There's too much to watch. The, the problem with binging from a water cooler standpoint is you never know how deep anyone else went. And yeah. so the, the, you always hit this wall where you can't talk about what's most exciting to you. We still haven't talked about Stranger Things <laughs> for that reason. <laughs> so I love the weekly cadence. It, it actually it makes you excited. Like, that's the way I grew up. We looked forward to next week's show. Yeah, totally. You're not on board? I don't think I'm on board. Yeah. Well, you just got to wait. I mean, these are not shows that are going to have, like, cliffhanger reveals and you no. know, universe-shaking ramifications. But it, they are telling a serialized telling. story, so I think. Everything is these days. So the other you big... Can, you can always wait till the end of the season. Yeah. Watch more Westworld okay. style. Okay. The other big news for Disney+, Plus. this is the Lucasfilm other show, Obi-Wan is confirmed. A Star Wars story. Ewan McGregor on stage with Kathleen Kennedy announcing that he has agreed to play the character again for mm-hmm. the prequel we, series. So we talked about this a little bit last week. What kind of Kenobi do you want? Do you want a general? You yeah. Wanna, no, no. You want a, a Ben? You want an old Kenobi? No, I want a general. <laughs> mm-hmm. So when was he a general? Uh, Clone Wars. Clone Wars, yeah. Wait, the cartoon? Also the movie. Oh, right, right, right. You did have a lot of Obi-Wan in Clone Wars. In the series, he uh, he had this whole uh, thing against Darth Maul. The fact that they kind of pulled back and on the Star Wars story stuff after Solo, and they with the seeds that they planted with Darth Maul and with uh, Kira, like that's where this stuff can pay off. Where you can have you can please the fans that love that relationship that uh, between uh, that that um, that. Uh, between Darth Maul and, and Obi Wan, that they saw in in Clone Wars, and have it fulfilled on screen here in Disney Plus in live action. 
I hope they don't retread exactly the Clone Wars stories, but if they touch on those, some of those points, that's fine too. Good fan service. Uh, and then on the movie side, uh, you had uh, finally P. Dr. Soul. You had some first images from that. Jamie Foxx and Tina Fey are announced. They actually gave you a plot synopsis. It's going to be a jazz teacher whose soul gets detached from him, and another soul has to then help that soul find its way also, back. Also, providing a voice is the guy from Hamilton, W. Diggs. W. Mm-hmm. Diggs, oh my gosh. It's yeah. Lafayette. Yeah. Yeah, he's on the TV show himself. He's on the Snowpiercer TV show. Uh, and uh, they have a new Disney Animation Studios movie, Rise and Last Dragon. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, Onward, the next Pixar film, they showed some footage from. And that's where Chris Pratt and Tom Holland were, were present for that. Uh, the Eternals came on stage. They announced some more casting for Eternals. You had not only did you see the cast there with their, some concept art for their costumes, which looks really cool, very Kirby-esque, also very kind of consistent with the, what they've designed for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but also Kit Harington from Game of Thrones cast as the Black Knight. This is mm-hmm. up there with the Moon Knight announcement like as like B characters mm-hmm. that are super badass. Yeah. <laughs> Like I hope that means that they're considering Eternal spinning off like a Black Knight show or something, you know, down the road. What is the Black Knight besides a classic pinball machine? A, it's a B level Marvel character who's With a f- lightsaber sword, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Like what did it come out after seventy seven? I don't know the origins of it actually. Huh. I'll have to look that up on, on some wikis. All right. Uh but that's the news. That's the haps. That's what's cracking from D23. Um, I did walk the show floor. I, uh, it's my second time at D23. I only spent like an hour and a half there. But I'm always impressed by how they run the show. They essentially create a miniature Disneyland or lines that they build on the show floor for everything. You had awesome exhibits for costumes of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You had the Stormtrooper costumes we saw from Comic-Con. Uh, they had a whole Pixar pavilion, the whole Parks pavilion where you saw the new Epcot designs, incredible Epcot posters that they have. They've kind of rebuilt that whole Epcot area. That's gonna, construction's going to go on. Uh, and I, I bought some merch. I bought an Epcot t-shirt and, and, uh, and a poster. Uh, that's from Silicon Valley. Yeah, uh, And then... So yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, wonderful convention, lovely show. Spent too much money, and I'm glad to be back. Cool. And you didn't even buy a lightsaber. You can you can buy off-brand lightsabers. <gasps> it's about the experience. Uh, well, I, I I choose to Disney's hopefully have that experience with my kid in the future. Uh, before we move on to our next segment, I want to let you know that this is only a test. Is also made possible this week by Caseta Smart Lighting Control from Lutron, pioneers in smart home technology. A lot of people think you need smart bulbs to get smart lighting, but there is a smarter way. Caseta's smart dimmers and switches replace the switch on your wall so that all the lights are controlled by that switch will act smart. Think about the places in your home where one switch controls multiple bulbs from ceiling lights, chandeliers, bathrooms, kitchens, and more. With Caseta, you save money by replacing just the switches instead of all the bulbs. And smart bulbs are only smart when the switch is on. If someone flips them off, you can say goodbye that smart control and connectivity. But Caseta switches are always smart even when the switch is off. With their Caseta dimmers, you don't need to buy smart bulbs, enjoy smart lighting. You actually get the best of both worlds with control from an app or your voice and control right at the switch. We have it set up in our home and nursery. So once I feed the baby, I can just use an app because I'm browsing Twitter and then flip off the lights and then tuck the baby away to sleep. Get smart lighting the smart way with Caseta by Lutron Smart Switches. Learn more about Caseta at Lutron, that's L U T R O N dot com slash test that's lutron.com slash test we are at the end of august the rumor is september 10th Mm -hmm. is the apple event Mm -hmm. that's coming up soon and with the new Apple event, we expect new iPhones, and we expect the launch of iOS 13. Well, we expect a date for both of those a things. A date for both of those yeah. soon. iOS 13, which is in beta, uh, kind of a 
buggy beta so far from a lot of people who've, who've used it and installed is it. Because I was going to ask, because it's so late in its development, I was hoping it was more refined. I'm really anxious to try out the new CarPlay functionalities where you can have both the media player and the map on the same screen. Yeah. So I was hoping it would be bug-free at this point. Well, it, I think the 13 was so buggy when the first beta was released. A lot of people, you know, especially on the iPad side, I've had not great experiences with it, with, with some apps just freezing. Yeah. Uh, they have issued iOS 13.1 beta, the first time they've done a point release for a beta um, to iterate on that. So they add some functionalities, some things like, you know, dynamic wallpapers, AirPods volume indicators, new home uh, new icons for a bunch of things. There were a couple of things that were supposed to be in 13 that they delayed, and they're now yeah. in this. But yes. th this is weird because... 13 is not even out yet, and you yeah. presume that they will release 13. Like they're not going to go straight to 13.1, so this is a beta for a, a more distant release. You think so? You don't think this the functionality here? Why is would they? Be? Why would they do a point release? That I I don't know. I, I imagine they've locked down 13 for release. Oh. That's my imagine. That's what I imagine. Okay. That's what this means to me. Wow. So th when people get 13, the full version, it's going to have less functionality than what people are seeing now with this 13.1 yeah, beta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I think. But it might come out soon after. I mean, right. There's no reason they. If they're testing this now, and presumably the actual release of the phones are yeah. going to be like three or four weeks away, right. thirteen point one could just be the thirteen. I don't it's, know. it's thirteen as a family. Uh, what, what do we know? We don't know. There's nothing really on thirteen point one that's like earth shattering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another event that is confirmed though, Microsoft has sent out invites for a hardware event on October 2nd oh, yeah? in New York. Presumably this is this year's big Surface event. Um, and for us, the question is whether it's just gonna be Surface uh, with new chips inside, or will there be any surprises, for example, on the HoloLens or Windows Mixed Reality side? That's the thing I'm most curious about. Sure. But that's right before New York Comic Con, so we won't be there, we'll just have missed it. Uh, Amazon, which bought Eero, the uh, the mesh Wi-Fi company, which makes really good products, uh, have announced services tied to Eero, subscription services. For example, you could pay, what is this, like $3 a month or $30 a year, you get secure, security features. Um, if you pay $100 a year, you get VPN built in from encrypt.me uh, and a one password subscription and Malwarebytes and uh, anti-virus uh, software. It's so weird when your router company is like, hey, what, I hate for something to go wrong, you know, maybe just <laughs> yeah. three more dollars in a month. And, and, and we'll start checking, we'll sniff your packets for you. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll call it security, okay? <laughs> yeah. Also, the, the VPN package with 1Password, you're not really saving money no. versus going out and buying a VPN and 1Password yourself. Yeah. yeah. And you don't so, like, the in. bundle doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Yeah. But it is a new business. I mean, it, it's way for... I think these type of hardware companies, like a lot of hardware companies, where they release a product that may be great, but it's, how do you run a business for that if you're not going to sell another version of this product? Right? You've sold as many Eros as you can or as many of these Nest things as you can. How do you, get, how do you make it a sustainable business if people aren't going to buy new ones like they do new phones every five years hey. or three years? It's got to be some type of subscription thing. Yeah. On your phone, though, uh, who here is you guys use Verizon? No. ATT? Okay, I'm only one who uses Verizon. Uh, Verizon is starting to opt in customers for a call filtering service, um, but only on the Android side by mm -hmm. default. Yeah, and it's rolling out only on certain Android phones. So it mostly comes out on Samsung phones. I mean, it's a pretty long list, year. and it has all the Galaxy S10s and S9s and S8s on there, and a bunch of the LG phones, Motorola phones as well. But uh, if you're on the iOS, you can access the service, but you have to download the Call Filter app manually. So that's a little bit of a PSA if you're on Verizon, which you guys don't, you guys aren't. Uh, did, did you guys talk about this last week? Android naming? Speaking no. Android? no. Oh, okay. The sweet quiche. Uh, this was this. I mean, if D23 wasn't this past weekend. This probably would have been our top story. Really? Android. What's the deal? It's moving away. <gasps> candy from dessert or candy names oh for their version releases. But they're sticking with the alphabet, like where they are. No. Oh my gosh. The dream is over. We're never gonna get to X, Y, and Z. How could they do it? Well, they explained. And this was my letter. In a big brand, I know, in a big brand update, 
They said for consistencies, Android Q is now Android 10. <sighs> Boo. <laughs> Boo. The dream is dead. Boo. <laughs> Dream is dead. Is this a cop out? It is one hundred percent a cop out. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's Android sad. ten. They had quince. They had quiche. quiche. <laughs> Sweet quiche. <laughs> There's so many options. They said no, none of them. So that's the news on the Android world. Hey, Jeremy, how's your Apple card? I have an Apple card. Did you get an Apple oh, card? Oh, that. Um, I I got the digital one. I have not received the titanium one. Is it yet. on its way? Yeah, it should be in the mail. When it comes, can you do a demo on how to clean it? Oh God. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, because I would hate for it to get smudged. Oh no, it's my Apple card. Yeah, yeah. That would look horrible if I were to hand that to somebody with a fingerprint on it. Wow. Think of the humiliation. <laughs> well, Apple's got you covered because there's a support page about how to properly clean your titanium Apple card. How weird is this? That there's a support page on how to clean your credit card. <laughs> because <laughs> we some, some fabrics a... like leather and denim might cause permanent discoloration. <sighs> this is I'm getting ahead of people complaining. I have this fancy card that now has stains on it because I put it in my jeans. It's a fancy card you got for free. So just chill out. Just use the card. Put it in your wallet. No, I, I swear to God. I hope that this is preemptive of nothing. This is... People are going to complain. Entitlement is at an all-time high. You know, I know the Amazon is burning. I know there's all sorts of yeah. dire warnings. This is the sign that we're in the worst timeline. <laughs> <laughs> that there's a support document for this? Yeah. yeah. There's also recent controversy on the Apple side because uh, it became public that this, they had a whole process to review Siri audio clips, basically. Oh, like gosh. When, 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 had, when uh, Siri would not get... Um, uh, a, uh, a response right for you, yeah, and it would not. And it, it had problem hearing you, or there was some bad user interaction. That clip would be archived, and they would then send it through some support teams, a uh, whole team of support teams. Um, and that's not potentially great because people didn't know they were necessarily. I'm sure not in. potentially great. That's yeah, bad. It's well, bad. I'm sure Amazon did the same thing. Well, and and Microsoft as well. So Apple just announced changes to the review process. Now it is opt in, not by default. And they're doing the work in-house as opposed to contractors. And now they promise they won't retain recordings. Even though in the past, when there was a way, for example, on the Facebook side for you to delete stuff, all they meant was we won't, we won't actually delete the history. We're just going to disassociate the history with your identifier. This, new, this story broke today, right? The apology yeah. and all that. So yeah. do you know what the opt-in actually gets you? Does it actually benefit you, or does it just benefit the Siri brain? Just the Siri brain. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you. Nope. Don't, don't opt into that stuff. Uh, and then, uh, last bit of news, Sphero and LittleBits, both companies we're fond of, are teaming up. They're merging. They're officially merging. I think, I think not, it's not entirely clear, but it's really more of a Sphero acquisition, like the LittleBits... A uh, founder is actually leaving the organization. Uh, this makes sense. Uh, I like the Sphero toys. I mean, most people, I think, probably uh, remember all the Star Wars licenses they had for, for that uh, uh, stuff. Uh, Little Bits also had a Star Wars license, but I really like the, the sort of build mentality for, you know, like five to 10 year olds that was embedded in the Little Bits kits. Yes. The Sphero ones, I felt like, were a little more advanced. So this is also, they're not uh, necessarily competing with each other in terms of age frames. I think this is good for both companies because it's going to be hard to survive. I thought Sphero didn't survive. Did it not go well, out of business? Well, they, they, the they, they had the pivot because the license stuff, which was very expensive to, to do license things and pay the licensor, that stuff went in waves and the last couple of products maybe didn't do so well, went on a heavy discount, and so uh, they had pivoted to educational toys. Okay. Programmable toys. Gotcha. Yeah. Like uh, little bits. But just like, it seems like a, a, a really good match, and hopefully uh, this, this is a category of toys because we both love both these companies that will flourish and continue to grow. And I think that does it. Any other bits of tech news you guys want to talk about? Anything else? Kind of a little, no. a little bit of a quiet week. We did. There was a new Joker trailer that just 
dropped while we're here. Oh. And I watched it, and it is creepy. Uh, we see a lot I'm... of Robert De Niro in this one. Oh, yeah? Not, not, I can't, can't get excited about this. Really? About the Joker movie. I, this trailer's better than the previous one. Do you love the Christopher Nolan um, do. Batman films? Yeah. All three of them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that does it for technology news then, because we had a long pop culture and Galaxy Edge talk. Um, and before we move to our next segment, I want you to know that This Is Only a Test is also made possible this week by Blizzard Entertainment's World of Warcraft Classic. Get ready to return to an era lost to legend. World of Warcraft Classic is available now. Coming just in time for the game's 15th anniversary, World of Warcraft Classic invites players to return to the world of Azeroth just as it was during its earliest days. This faithful, authentic recreation captures the danger, excitement, and glory of the original game, and you get to relive the timeless adventures that defined World of Warcraft's legacy. You can fight for the Horde or the Alliance in the ongoing struggle between South Shore and Terran Mill, and then gear up to take on the Dragons of Blackwing Lair as more of the game's legendary content opens over time. There's so much to discover and explore. WoW Classic is included with your regular World of Warcraft subscription at no additional charge, so you can switch between the original experience and the latest content as you see fit, and World of Warcraft Classic, again, is available right now to play. You can head over to wowclassic.com slash this is only a test to learn all about it and get ready to relive the legend. Again, that's wowclassic.com slash this is only a test. Now it's time for a moment of science. All right, apologies in advance. We're going to talk about a lot of serious stories this week on Moment of Science. I actually want to start with the Amazon. Like, I think we've all heard the stories about the the fires. There's something like 70,000 fires raging in the Amazon. Um, I bring it up because I think there's a couple bits of information that are either not verified or inaccurate that are out there so that you should just be slightly more skeptical of. Like, I keep hearing, even on like NPR, you'll hear them repeat the line, the Amazon is the lungs of the earth, uh, and sometimes pinpoint numbers that it like produces 20% of the oxygen on, on the earth. How much oxygen is produced by like a one area because of the dynamic way that CO2 is exchanged for oxygen and how that plays with like ocean-based life forms that, that make this like plankton? It's a really hard calculation. Amazon probably doesn't produce 20%, it's probably closer to 6%, but that even the framing of that question is sort of wrong. But so the scale of this is off. Then there's a lot of information out there about how many fires are burning compared to last year, that it's nearly double what we saw last year. And they're pinpointing this on uh, people clearing the land for ranchers to come in and graze cattle. There's some indication that that's true, but the numbers of fires raging while much more than last year in an uptick, uh, it is not at a record level for the Amazon over the past 20 or 30 years. In fact, there's been multiple times when the number of fires have been higher than this. Uh, so we do not know all the full reasons that these are, are being burned. Probably some are being intentionally set. Some of that intentional setting is part of a yearly cycle that is uh, goes through that uh, farmers and ranchers go through down in the Amazon to clear some underbrush. So I'm not sure this is not good, what is happening in the Amazon, but I think some of the panic and like enragement that uh, that is fueling some of the Twitter conversation might be overwrought based on the data that exists. Uh, and they tie back to social media posts in Brazil that we don't have links to that somebody posted on social media and is actually intentionally setting fires. So we don't have this like strong evidentiary link. All that being said, this is like one of those like real quandaries. And I heard it um, uh, put in an article this way. If someone from another country was like, hey, US, you're cutting down trees in your national parks and that's bad for the global climate, how would we react here to that? Like, is that okay for other countries to tell us how to manage Sovereignty our issue. national parks? So I think this is like a, a much more complicated political issue than we give it credit for. And the simple like, we have to protect the Amazon 
while I agree with that, is much more complicated an ecosystem that exists. All right. Another serious story is late yesterday, we got word out of a leak out of a federal court out of Cleveland that Purdue Pharmaceuticals, which was the nation's largest manufacturer of opioids that was run by the Sackler family and largely pinpointed for um, their overproduction of certain opioids is largely linked to overprescription of opioids, uh, has offered to go bankrupt. Uh, and through that bankruptcy, fund 10 to $12 billion of settlements for over 2,000 cases that have been brought against the suit. Now, that sounds like a lot of money. It's not. It's they not. profited like something like $35 billion um, from the op opioids. Over and also the, the estimates for the kind of addressing the epidemic is in the range of like $100 billion. Yeah, and it could be required. much higher than that even. Uh, depending on the long-term health consequences of this. Also no jail people. time. Uh, good riddance to Purdue Pharmaceuticals. This is um, a black mark on our country. Uh, so from that sense, it's good. Uh, people that were affected by this will never have any restitution. And uh, the Sacklers are, uh, haven't really paid a price uh, as uh, for the malfeasance that's really on display here. And we're still not talking about like doctors and people that prescribe these drugs being held accountable for this, but at least it's a step that Purdue Pharmaceuticals is being white washed away. Uh, and I hope it's sort of uh, remembered in history for the incredible damage that has been done to to people across this country. Okay, uh, on to something a little brighter. Uh, let's talk about batteries. Uh, lithium ion batteries, you have some of those in both of your cars, gentlemen. That's true. Uh, and actually, a large percentage of your battery goes to transporting your batteries around because they're heavy. <laughs> yes. And lithium ion batteries have always seen like they're kind of at their limit in terms of power density uh, because lithium ion batteries have, have a lithium ion uh, anode and then they have a, a graphite uh, on the other side. And that graphite is really heavy to sort of conduct. And they're potentially prone to um, well, fires uh, if they're exposed to oxygen. Now, a lot has been done to mitigate that, but the energy density is something you can't um, overcome. So scientists have been working hard about going from a lithium ion, which is like more sort of like a liquid based, uh, to a lithium metal situation where the actual lithium metal is serving as the anode uh, in this case, because there's better sort of transport. You can get up to 33% more energy density in that battery. Very fascinating. The big problem, lithium metal isn't entirely stable. It has something called uh, den dendrites. They'll come off the metal. Essentially like little fibers start uh, protruding from the metal. And if they connect to the cathode on the other side. Grounded. Yeah, and that short circuit inside of a high energy capacity uh, battery can lead to fires. Uh, and so beyond just the la loss of efficiency you have as these dendrites form, uh, you have uh, safety issues. Uh, well, a group out of Stanford this week published a paper in the journal Jewel, best name for a journal ever. Um, they coated the lithium metal with this aluminum oxide type material that had um, some fluorine substituted in for the oxygen. So it still permitted the transfer of energy um, with that the, those fluorinated atoms uh, through it, but limited the dendrites actually uh, emerging from, from the lithium. And with this coating, they say that the, the dendrites aren't forming, so now you have a, a higher likelihood of a lithium metal battery um, being stable. And Long I, way to go. This will be even heavier, I assume. No, this will be a lighter. lot lighter, really, than the your graphite. current battery. Because you, like, you should think about the the graphite is weighing your your current battery down, mm. and this doesn't have to have that in it. Wow. So you have a ton more energy density. So even if they put the same weight battery in your in your car, you're going to have thirty three percent more energy. That's like a massive, massive, massive deal. Uh, and last story, which I think I, I didn't realize this until uh, I read the story in the New York Times. Um, there is a, 
a species of rhinos that are endangered called white rhinos. And there's a subspecies of them called the northern white rhinos um, that is critically endangered. And we are now down to two. Two white rhinos, northern white rhinos on the planet. And they're both female. That's all we need. Uh, Cloning? Cloning? (laughs) So the males passed away um, a couple years ago, and a group in Italy is actually trying to uh, do IVF, essentially, for these northern rhinos, for the two males. So they actually extracted an egg, shipped it to Italy, uh, unfroze some of the sperm they, they had collected from the males, uh, and have done an artificial insemination right now and are actually trying to actually grow this new rhino in the lab to save the species. Uh, this has never been done to sort of save a species like this before, at least uh, certainly not in a rhino. Uh, but we're at this point where like this is all we can do uh, to try to sa- uh, stave off the extinction uh, of this species. Uh, it's showing some promise, but even then there's, because we're down to literally two animals, this is, the recovery from this is um, is fraught with uh, uh, with a lot of issues. I hope this works. Fingers crossed. Knock on wood. Uh, I think it'll work. Uh, and for those who want to learn more about Shannon Entropy, I'll I'll post some <laughs> links on Twitter that came up last week. That was awesome. Shannon Entropy is so fascinating. Uh, I went on a super deep dive on it, Jeremy. Yeah, I'll get you excited. You got into Shannon. it. Yeah, I got into it. You know, I I just want to point out that you didn't touch on indigenous life and the possible extinction of it in the Brazilian rainforest. Oh, there's a ton of indigenous people that live in those rainforests that uh, are being impacted by these. But also other species, you know, how many percentage of the world's species are indigenous to that area? You know, that's nearly impossible to calculate. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying that, that that's another element to consider. We ready? We are. The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. We are less than a month now away from Oculus Connect 6, for which we hope to see a lot of new games. We talked about essentially Respawn's AAA game. Hopefully we'll play that. What is it? We don't know. A shooter? Presumably. Presumably. And uh, even the games that we saw last year that haven't come out yet, of course I'm talking about Insomniac's Stormland, which I believe is being shown off at PAX multiplayer for the first time. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a lot of... As you guys talked about this last week, Insomniac, nope. and uh, it's Sony's acquisition yep, yep. of Insomniac. Uh, that's great for them. They did, had a huge success, of course, with their Spider-Man game. Uh, but they are working on VR stuff. They were working on AR stuff. They were working on stuff for Magic Leap. Uh, and Stormland will still come out on the Oculus platform. Not just, because uh, I think that's, that's an Oculus exclusive. Uh, the multiplayer news, though, is interesting because when we chatted with them last year, we had heard they were experimenting with multiplayer. They wanted that to be a thing. Yep. And they talked about it being three players. Mm-hmm. And it's it going to be two. sounds like it's only going to be two. I think it's going to be two. But the entire game is playable with either solo or two players. With drop-in yep. multiplayer. No lobbies. You just play your game, open it up, and people, your, your friend or whoever, can drop in, and then the enemy density and I difficulty don't think will so. scale I don't up. think that's true. I've read that it didn't. No, uh, the, the, the enemy or the drop-in. Yeah, yeah. No, that, the, that the, basically the difficulty level of the worlds don't change. I think they do. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. I'll go with you on that then. Because they want to encourage strategic approaches to attacking right. the bases and using all that crazy locomotion that they've built in, all the gliding and the, the vaulting and the, the running. Uh, so, curious, we're not going to be at PAX to play it, unfortunately, but hopefully we'll be able to play it when we head over Still to, no release to OC6. Date. No release date. It's got to be this year. But they said this year, yeah. but they haven't Do said Do you think when. they're going to announce the release date of PAX? I think it'll uh, Oculus Connect. Yeah, that makes more sense. It could be dropping like very shortly after that. I would not be surprised. They got to be close. Uh, and, and other games on the VR side, uh, you got uh, Vanishing Realms. Remember this game? Yeah, yeah, this it was, was a, a huge, early, early Steam game, major Vive game. Yeah, the, the pitch was you never hold, you never. It was the first game that gave you a sword in your hand and a shield in your hand in VR, not just. Who's the, the developer? Pistols. Kelly Bailey. Is one that sound right? single one dude developer, and he he worked at Valve. Yes, and uh, then he left to do his own thing, and he did the entire game himself. 
But out now is the expansion. It's yeah. now out of early access, and there's a whole. It completes the story. I haven't got a chance to play it yet, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's launching. Um, Sundered Rift is named the expansion. Twelve dollars on Steam. And the first game is 1.0 now too, so they've incorporated a lot of the bugs into that. Bug fixes. Yeah, yes. bug fixes in that first game version. But the expansion is supposed to be even bigger than the first game. Yeah, six new realms made for VR, uh, new weapons, including a throwing hammer, war spears, bashing shields, uh, and new monsters, of course. That kind of VR melee combat game with swords and shields has come a long way. You have things like Gorn, uh, Sword and Sorcery, and a lot of games that have great executions yep. of VR swords. I wonder if this will feel more like a throwback. We pl I played it a little bit. Um, oh, I should say I watched my son play it because it's one of his favorite games. So when I told him that the 1.0 was out, he wanted to dive in there. Mm. And it looked like it played great. Like mm. it really, you can't just waggle. You know, that's the trick. Like you can't just go up to a, an enemy yes. and do this. Like Which you can in Gorn. There has to be a strategy to it of, right. of parrying and, and, you know, using your shield. Which Rec Room did. I mean, it's kind of artificially yeah. done because <laughs> right. like, they make the enemies invincible until a certain part of the animation is completed. or So it has to be a, a dance yeah. between enemies. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really clever way to do it. Uh, and then uh, last week, did you guys talk about uh, Westworld? Yes. Westworld VR. So, uh, tell it, uh, did you get it? Were you so, able to play it? I did. Uh, 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 Sorry I wasn't here last week to talk about it, but I did do that demo where I played like half an hour of the game. Uh, the first intro level plus uh, I think it's part of the second level. It's five levels, about you know four to six hours to complete. Uh, it's out now, so some of you have probably already played it and beat it. I went back in at home and mm -hmm. played it, and I was too scared. It was a scary really? game. Really? If you're not into like horror yeah. and the suspense, like the, even that first level is really intense. I'm going to go huh. in and, and beat it anyway. The production value is awesome for the game. It doesn't feel like just like a, a promo PR game. It feels like they really thought it out and made a story for it. But what I played from, at least from the demo, half an hour, basically the first two levels of the game, it felt like a very straightforward uh, adventure story. Mm -hmm. um, not, you know, there's puzzles and there are time elements, and they incorporate lore and a lot of the uh, elements because you play a you play a host, you play a robot essentially, and you have a voice in your head, and you can, you know, you can access a lot of the things that you see in the show in terms of how the hosts are programmed. Uh, but not not the kind of like the show is so groundbreaking in its use of ideas and its kind of rule breaking of narrative and time that I don't think the game matches that level of ambition. It still, is, even though as high production value as it is, it's still pretty straightforward yeah. from what I played. Okay, uh, but uh, you know it's a full game and it's out now. Uh, and Servios made that it's a developer behind that, and, and for their uh, other game, Battle Wake, that's coming out September 10th, and so I, I'd love to get in there and, and play that. Hopefully, do a review. Um, you also have a, a desktop VR game go make its over to Quest Cloudlands 2. Well, now hold on, we played that on Go, right? No. Yeah, the Cloudlands. Yeah, the the mini golf game. Oh, okay. Yep. This is mini golf. Yep. In my head, I was thinking Windlands. Windlands. Yeah, yeah. That's right. No, okay, I, never mind. I wish that would be yeah, awesome. That would be amazing. Bring that to me on Quest. Okay. This is a Cloudlands mini golf. Okay. Yep. And but it's it's Cloudlands too. So it's got the full it's got full golfing now. So you can go on on actual golf courses, and it's still multiplayer enabled. Um, I believe like four players. I had a really good time in that in Go. Even on Go, with like it, yeah. did, it did a great job of using that three DOF controller to simulate like a six DOF experience. Because it's, it's, it's social. It's, golf and it's is totally a, fun. It's a yep. social experience. Totally. Yeah. You're just hanging out. Yeah. This it's I'm excited to play this. I, I actually I have it installed. I just have not had a chance to play it yet. A lot of levels in Cloudlands too. Yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah, I think they did they hopefully it's a great game. Uh, uh, twenty bucks. Yep. Uh, uh Carmack is coming to Joe Rogan's podcast. Mm. Um so we will be eh. looking forward to that. I I mean he's he, you never know. Like you know, he, sometimes he asks some really interesting questions. I just I don't know how much about John Carmack he actually knows. It's just a weird like. What a is Joe Rogan into VR? <laughs> yeah. Like uh, I'm sure like he played Doom. Like I I I bet a lot of the, his enthusiasm is going to come from John's old games. Um, but I'll be very curious to see what they go into about VR and how deep Joe goes. 
Okay. I have a question for you, Norm. Yeah. So with this, you know, Stormland being in the news again and thinking about Asgard's Wrath coming out later this yeah. year. Yeah, these are two big mm. Oculus games. Right. Next month we have a potentially even bigger game being unveiled. What, how are we going to play these games? Because spending so much time on the index. I got it. You got to do Revive. That's my question to you. I, I might be playing these on Re Revive over Rift S. I mean, I've done games that, games that I play with Rift S. Like I played all of a Defector on Rift S yeah. and that was fine. And it looked good. Of, of course, that looks better than it did on, on, on the Rift. See, and that's where I'm at. Like, I never got the Rift S. Like, I'm straight Rift. And whenever I put that on, not only is the resolution lower, but the field of view is so apparently smaller. The two things that make me want to play everything on the index is field of view and comfort. The, the headband comfort is mm. so much better on index. Than what? Than Rift? Than, than Rift S. Oh, than Rift S? Okay, yeah. I can see that. Yeah, yeah. The I, the Halo headband thing, I th yeah, I feel this, it, it, it see, grips my head in a, not in the best way. The original Rift is perfectly comfortable for me, but the optics are lacking now. It's yeah, I'm not even talking about the frame rate. Like the frame rate stuff looks amazing. If I can get 144 hertz mm -hmm. on like on on, on Allward, I'm playing that all the time. A Beat Saber 144 hertz all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, No Man's Sky. Yeah, that's a that's a 80, 90 hertz game. So that one has some. What are the What are the odds that the controls will work well? I mean, the Revive developers are pretty good at adapting. Yeah. So you just have to wait a little bit, a week or two after the game comes out, till you get it all dialed in. I think I'm gonna probably start it on Rift. On Rift, yes, yeah. just to get into the game and uh -huh. play as much as I can, and probably you know, for the review, do it all in Rift S because that's the exclusive experience, right? Uh, but if there's an opportunity later on to yeah. jump into an uh, index and play it. I'm gonna do that too, and probably like for long games, we're talking about Asgard's Wrath is a long, yeah. long game, and Stormlands could be a long, long game. Maybe the first four hours, four to six hours, is in Rift, and then the rest of it's on Index. I mean, if, if the controls, again, if the controls, if there's parity there. I'm even wondering about like, well, what are the trade-offs? If would I rather do it on in Quest using virtual desktop and streaming through Steam? You know, and then I, through I, Reaper, don't, no, I, I don't want to do that or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a no, lot of that, steps. That's a, I, the latency, I think. Hey, maybe Oculus measure. will release something at uh, Oculus Connect. Maybe they they'll have their own first party uh, Quest wireless. You would rather play it on Quest than, just for than, tetherless than, than Rift? Rift? Than, oh, then uh, first gen Rift. Yes, of course. exactly. Yeah, that's if you don't have the option for Rift S, I guess. Yeah. You know, having done a lot of going between Quest, Rift S, and and Index. I like the full RGB subpixels. Yeah, I mean the 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 uh, the OLED on Index, even though it's higher resolution, uh, the subpixel arrangement I'm not a fan of. Mm, I don't I don't mind that at all. It's the uh, for me putting on the Rift nowadays. It, it really for the, the first, original. Yeah, for the first time, it just feels like I'm cramped. Yeah, uh, there are a couple more games that have uh, early or releases. Uh, uh, Jason Schnell's company, Schnell Games, had uh, uh, Until You Fall. It's a melee combat game. I think it's an early access now. Uh, people are saying it's very much like Infinity Blade in VR. So again, hmm. another sword fighting combat game, a little more intense. Uh, I can't wait to try that out. And then you've been doing a siloed game on the quest, dude. T for God, yeah, no, no, no. We, you got to try this. You have a you have a quest. Please download Side Quest. I know it sounds like a weird, you know, I'm hacking my my quest. No, I thing. have Side Quest already. Oh, you, have you used it? So I, I mean, I don't know what game you're talking about, though. No, but you've hooked it up, yeah, yeah. so you know how to transfer games. Great. Then just click the one that says T for God and put it on your quest because it's awesome. Uh, you need a, you can use any size space, but you, the bigger, the better. And what it does, and I'm sure many of our listeners already know about this and they share my enthusiasm, is it will look at your guardian or whatever they call it, your, your space, and then it will manufacture a game world that uses exactly the amount of space that you have. It will take the biggest rectangle possible inside your space. So it's kind of like, uh, remember that game, Unseen Diplomacy. Yeah, sort of like that. But that was, a, you needed like its size space. This right. scales based on the amount of space you have. Procedurally. Yes. And, all, and then it makes a space where all of the locomotion is done physically. There's no teleporting, right? You, the, you the, run around circles. Yeah. So you walk around this space and it, it manufactures impossible spaces. So you can walk around a wall and see something and then continue like walking clockwise around on this wall and the scenery will constantly be different as soon as you turn a corner. So if you, you know, you're physically in the same space, but you just don't feel like it, and you're taking elevators that take you to new floors and you're crawling through cav, you know, little, um, like, uh, I don't know, like crawl spaces. This is, uh, not enough of your games do this. Break 
the rules of like of spatial awareness. Exactly. Yeah, and the whole time you're you're shooting at, at bots, but that's just something to do. It really is an experiment in these impossible spaces and exploring them and what can you manufacture with inside, you know, confined spaces and how can you make that feel like a bigger space. And it's really successful. And what's great about it is the same thing people loved about, you know, it's, uh, simple games like Job Simulator. It's like all of the movement is physically based. I mean, it really maximizes the immersion factor of virtual reality when every time you move through the space, you're, it's because you're moving your own feet. What, uh, what, what's the largest space you've played it in? Just my, yep, yeah, that's, that would be fun, right? Yeah. So take it to a, a, the badminton court and like yeah. use an entire side of the court. I've just done a room in my house, which is, you know, like two meters by three meters. This not, is also what's perfect for LBEs, you know, LBE escape yeah. rooms. This yeah. is, this is the kind of environment that I want rather than just an empty room, like really take advantage of the fact that you can break the rules of, of spatial logic. Uh, and then do you guys talk about the, uh, space pirate trainer yes. teaser video last week? We did. Okay. The multiplayer combat game. Mm -hmm. I really hope to see that at OC six as well. Yeah, I wonder. It doesn't seem like a flagship thing to, to me. It's, cer it's certainly third party, so I don't know if they'll have it there. But it, it would be fun to see it played and fun to play it. Well, th that's one where the two people are playing it in a shared, yeah, shared virtual geometry. Yeah. Right, and we have not seen that yet. And how does that alignment work? And, right. That's a good good and, question. And this is something that. I imagine Oculus has to support or wants to support at some point because they did experiment it with that uh, dead and buried demo they had. Yeah. And so that I could see being a big announcement at OC6 as well. Okay, that does it for the podcast this week. Uh, thank you all for listening. I think we're going to have a really special episode next week as well, fingers crossed. And... Anything you guys want to give shout outs to? I'm off to Dragon Con tomorrow. If you're there, come say hi. I think I'm doing five different cosplays. Oh my goodness. I'm doing something different this year. I've actually opted out of being on panels. I'm usually on like eight panels and I was just like, it was all too much last year. Uh, so I'm just going to go attend stuff. Uh, last year I went to like a puppetry kind of workshop, which was awesome. So I'm going to try to find another random track to drop into I think a lot of like tested uh, friends and family like Bill Dran will be there. Um, come say hi. Uh, Gary Wood, I think, has a panel at PAX. PAX. He's also selling some space rocks. We tried to get him on the episode this week, but maybe he'll, he'll be in a future episode. But space rocks is a real thing for sale. You heard on This Is Only a Test first <laughs> years ago. But uh, yeah, Gary's also giving the keynote on Friday at PAX. So uh, that's going to be very cool. Have a great Labor Day weekend if you're in the States. If not, have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time. Got another outro from our man or woman who knows. Whoa, Hawk. These are epic. Hi there, I didn't see you. Pass it. The poop remix next week will be rough on us. We roughly think we have about 37 trillion cells in the human body that are human. Yeah. Uh, and we think somewhere around 30 trillion bacteria cells in our body as well. 30, 30 trillion, trillion bacteria, bacteria cells. cells. All sorts of stuff. Yeah. That's not surprising in our body. It's big. Yeah. Big. big. Yeah. 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 The end yeah. capsule yeah. chromosome. Yeah. Telomere differences yeah. is microbiome. Yeah. Base radiation. Our pediatrician is huge on probiotics. Uh, time time space. space. Radiation from space. Bacteria. Yeah. Differing diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ecosystem yeah. lives in certain space. 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 It's big. Yeah. Big. Yeah. 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 Bacteria. Bacteria. On that scale. Yeah. 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 Grumble, grumble, grumble. Our pediatrician is huge on probiotics. Microtelomere differences. Big. Microbiome. Microgravity. Yeah. 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 Do you want to hear the scale of this this situation? How, like microbiomes are big. Is like, it log normal? <laughs> <laughs> it's more Gaussian. <laughs> <laughs>